Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second day of the Tech for Rights Expo. Thank you very much for joining us. In today's program, we have an amazing lineup of panelists, and our program today actually is largely informed by um, the contributions we received pursuant to the call for papers that we submitted for the Tech for Rights Expo. Uh, but however, there'll be one panel on AI and technology that is not actually informed by the contributions we received, but we're actually looking forward to that discussion and looking forward to all the contributions we received, including the blog articles, as well as the creative content. And I hope they will inspire very insightful conversations around technology and human rights. So I, do, I just do want to acknowledge all the contributors on the call today and thank you very much for responding to our call. Um, I'd also like to let everyone know that all the outputs that we received are going to be published in what we are calling a digital rights magazine. <coughs> uh, this magazine will be submitted as one of the outputs of this Tech for Rights Expo. And if you were there actually yesterday, you must have had our director does, did mention that the CHR is both, you know, an academic institution as well as an NGO institution. And we do have publications that we do submit. I also want to encourage everyone, if you are interested, you can use the chat box function, ask any questions that you have. And if you feel you want to make a vocal contribution, please feel free. If there's time, I will allow you to do so. So without further much ado, I'm going to introduce our first presentation, which is actually a contribution showcasing innovation. It's an app demonstration that is called Astria Justice that is going to be presented by Courtney Takura Mukoya. So Takni Takuya Mukoya is actually the founder of what we are calling Cortex Technologies. This is a um, company that was registered in 2021. Its founder and CEO is Courtney Takura Mukoya, who graduated from Midland State University Faculty of Law. And the co-founder is Pada Moya Chikumba, who is doing computer science at the National University of Science and Technology. They are joined by actually other founding members of this uh, call today. Cortex Technology is a legal technology company which identifies problems that are faced mainly in the legal sector and then finding what we are calling tech-oriented solutions to address and fix these problems. Its latest project is what is being featured here today, which is called Astria Justice. It's a legal technological solution which, is seen, which has seen and actually won numerous awards, including uh, the company winning the Social Innovation Challenge in 2021 in Africa, as well as the 2021 Potras Hackathons Awards for Innovative Drive. Through the project called Cortex Technologies, it has been chosen to participate in what it's calling the Unleash Plus program 2021 to 2022. So before I introduce um, Courtney Takura, um, we are going to first see the app and then I'm going to introduce Courtney Takura, who is going to tell us more about the app and the work that they are doing around this app. Um, I'm going to give this over to Thiruna, who is going to play the video, and then I'm going to give Courtney Takura a chance to talk more about the video.
Thank you very much for that. Um, looks interesting, but I think we need a bit of a more background around this and Courtney, you're the person who can give us this background. Welcome. If I have any questions, I'll pause after you tell us more about this app. What is the idea behind this app? What motivated the creation of this app? What is this app used for? Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time and um, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, so what, what motivated this uh, development was uh, a realization that uh, we needed uh, something new, something uh, that addressed uh, the constant human rights violations going on in Zimbabwe, in the Sadak region, and uh, obviously in Africa at large. Uh, so a new approach that we thought of after we had made a um, consultation and uh, done sort of like a market research on the problems and the pain points that people face when they try to access a remedy was that we had to come up with an application. So it was a response to, a response to the ongoing uh, human rights violations so that we would uh, provide a solution uh, no matter how much we write, no matter how much we speak, but in the end, people need to get help. And uh, we thought of it as a toolkit that uh, has uh, all the functions that people would need to, to get the help they require when a human rights violation uh, has happened. All right. Is there a particular target group for this particular app, or it's generally available to to all populations? So uh, thank you for that question. So you'd notice that um, as it stands right now, it is uh, providing civil and political rights knowledge. But we are in the process of expanding so that we target uh, various groups. So for civil and political. Um, uh, rights, mainly uh, those would be human rights defenders, but uh, generally anyone can, can, can access and use it, but uh, mainly those that, um, that are active in activism and uh, defending other people's rights. But we will be targeting also other vulnerable groups such as uh, children, women, um, uh, children, women, uh, LGBT uh, groups, uh, so that we, we also uh, provide what is specific for them uh, in that regard. All right. Um, and just I'm um, giving you two minutes for this. Um, in terms of impact, are you able to speak as to the impact that you're seeing already with this, um, with this app and how it's actually um, sort of helping when it comes to access to justice in Zimbabwe? Okay, thank you so much. Um, so impact now is uh, a bit uh, low because of uh, uh, penetration of mobile phones and mobile application in Zimbabwe. Uh, so we are now in the process of trying to diversify so that others can access these services on uh, WhatsApp chatbots and uh, can also dial a USSD code and access. But so far, so good. We have noticed tremendous um, impact and uh, testimonials to the effect that um, Heart and Soul Radio and TV in Zimbabwe had to do a documentary where you can actually watch testimonials of people speaking to how this solution has been able to assist them. Uh, on a personal level, I have had to use it myself and uh, the police had to request to search my bags, but because I knew what the, 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 the solution, uh, I was empowered with Astria Justice, I simply had to assert my rights. So that's far the impact we have had now and uh, we are still going and in innovating so that accessibility improves and we reach even rural communities. All right, um, 
Um, I, I have to move on to the next presenter because I know they are rushing somewhere. So if there are any other questions directed to you, I will, you know, I'll just direct them to you as soon as um, somebody posts them on the chat box. But feel free to, you know, post a link to your website or to any of the work that you've done where people can engage and go to your website and learn more about the app that uh, you have developed. Congratulations on that. And I wish you all the best with, um, with the upcoming awards and I hope you, you know, emerge successful. All right, uh, okay, great. Uh, so our first presenter are two amazing characters who submitted a, a blog article titled The Vital Role of Fintechs in Driving the Achievement of Financial Inclus Inclusion in Africa. It was uh, developed by Riyad Hanslow. He's the head of risk and regulatory at Yoko and Mubiana Tumelo Uyagwa, who is a financial inclusion specialist. A welcome, please introduce yourself and you know, proceed and, and tell us more about uh, your article and the ideas behind it, welcome. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll start off and thank you so much for that, that lovely uh, introduction, Mary Stella, we really appreciate it. Just checking that everybody can see my screen. So thumbs up would be great. Yes, we can see your okay. screen. Perfect, perfect, thanks. Um, so maybe just a bit of a, a one minute intro into to who I am. Um, I have worked in the financial inclusion space for the past five years. I have experience in uh, remittances, cryptocurrency and mobile lending and savings as well. And I, I focus on, special, I focus on um, social impact, ESG, sustainability, um, and just really understanding the customer and how the, the products that we have are our best fit for the, the customer. Um, we have maybe a one liner before we jump into it. Sure. Um, my name is Riyad. I look after risk and regulation at Yoko. Part of that includes um, the ESG portion and, um, and ensuring that customers are protected, but also um, that we sort of strive for um, our mission, which is really centered around financial inclusion, which has really been the inspiration uh, for this particular piece of work. And we hope um, to get a lot of engagement from each of you as we sort of go through the process. Awesome, thank you. Cool, so I think a lot of us are familiar with that, this number, this 1.7 billion, but I think it's good to just reiterate it. So that is the number of people that still don't have access to, to financial services. Um, and a lot of these people reside in developing regions, right? This number definitely has been decreasing over the years, but as, um, as of the last um, survey done by the World Bank, um, that was in 2017, we still see that 43% of people in Sub-Saharan Africa don't have access to formal financial services. I think what's important to note is that coming from 25% of people being financially um, included in 2011, we see that there's a lot of strides um, and growth that is happening um, to get to this um, goal, this big goal of like financial inclusion. Um, and some of the things that we've seen um, that are progressing this and that are driving this are greater access to very simple digital banking solutions. A really key example of this that a lot of us know of is mobile money, um, especially in the African context and how um, over the, the last decade, we've seen um, a mobile money double from when it just started in 2011. So we know that um, uh, financial inclusion is like, very important, but it then becomes a strategic imperative for the governments and the, and the people who rule the countries um, about progressing this in a very holistic way. And as a result, what we see are we get financial inclusion policies and strategies that are rolled out across these different countries. Uh, what we tend to find is that there are two competing objectives with these financial inclusion strategies, and these are seldom balanced. The first one being a practical meeting um, of the, sorry, practically meeting the unique banking and financial needs um, of the citizens and the people who are financially excluded versus aligning these with global, um, global goals, specifically the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for this one. And what we tend to find um, is that there's a heavy bias towards um, achieving an alignment with the UN SDGs. Um, and as a result, we see strategies and policies that are not practical um, for public and private sector to actually implement, um, or, or um, we see that they're not well suited, the solutions that come out of it are not well suited in actually assisting um, the financially excluded. 
And I think what then happens is this begs the question, like, is, is practicality or is the lack of practicality a major contributing factor um, to Africa's continuous lag when we compare um, how we are achieving meaningful financial inclusion compared to other developing regions? Another really important fact to think about when we speak about um, financial inclusion is like, what exactly is financial inclusion, right? And I think we're all from different places here. Um, and even just myself, like financial inclusion in Zambia looks very different to financial inclusion in South Africa, me having lived in, in both places. Um, and, and with that, the way we define it evolves and is constantly evolving, right? Um, what we find is traditionally financial inclusion was termed or defined as banking the unbanked. And this is uh, by offering them a bank account or access to formal or formal bank account. Um, but as I mentioned, as, as we have gone through this journey, like there's a lot of evolution, there's a lot more to what it means for, you know, to define or to understand financial inclusion. Some of the elements, the attributes, the outcome and just the different flavors of financial inclusion um, involve it being like a cornerstone and in inclusive economic growth. Um, we see that with a lot of informal markets here and SMEs um, that we need to make sure that we're addressing, addressing everybody in the market. Um, it is multifaceted, it is multidimensional. It is not just about providing access to a bank account. It is different depending on uh, the African country, the unique circumstance that, that the individuals go through. Um, and I'm pursuing that even as time progresses, that changes quite a bit. Um, the affected population that is financially excluded, it varies from place to place um, and over time changes, whether it's rural communities, women, youth, migrants, um, you name it. Um, in line with the economic growth, it's a really good way to address um, unemployment and an, an, effic an effective and quick way um, to, to kind of, uh, they, they tie like, very well hand in hand. And then a lot of um, questions around the, the, the relationship between financial inclusion as well as the lag in Africa behind the rest of the developing world. I think with all of this in mind, it's really important to talk about the historical obstacles that have gotten us to, to this place. Um, and practically, what does it actually mean for financial inclusion? Awesome. So I, so I think it's really important for us to sort of acknowledge the obstacles that both um, incumbents and financial technologies and new market entrants play um, or, or encounter when playing in this space. I think the first is really around, you know, restrictive non-inclusive credit models. Um, we've seen in financial services regulation and, and, financials, uh, and financial inclusion policies in general is that there's always an inherent bias and skew towards um, leaning towards the things that we know and sort of a gold standard when it comes to uh, financial data or, um, or the method in which credit worthiness is determined. What this means is that it continues to perpetuate cycles of exclusion that we've seen historically um, in individuals being able to be granted credit, as an example. Um, what we also see is that these methods and ways of being able to determine credit worthiness are really outdated and don't really speak to the types of data that is now available um, or actually it will ever be available for particular types of um, the excluded segment. I think the second is really is around you know, the use of legacy technology is that incumbents continue to, you know, retrofit um, existing banking technology to attempt to meet the needs of, um, of the financially excluded. What we find, though, is that in most instances, this fails. And it fails because uh, the, the model that is utilized, you know, to, to reach the financially excluded is really um, a bank going up and setting up a, a branch in a rural area in the hopes that, um, you know, they gain more coverage. What we find, though, is that this is also pre uh, presented an opportunity for fintechs um, to really innovate in the space. And, you know, the, the mobile money example is a really good one um, in that, you know, um, uh, market entrants are not um, uh, bogged down by the use of existing legacy technology and are free to innovate, collaborate and partner uh, with other types of technology providers in order to be able to reach um, to reach a, a, a wider net um, or a greater portion of the financially excluded. And lastly, I think you know the uh, another uh, another important um, 
obstacle to acknowledge is really the overregulation that we find in financial services. And you might think that I'm crazy for saying this, but I think that it's really important to acknowledge that uh, financial services regulation, particularly in Africa, has really been over-engineered for the most part. Um, and really, um, you know, while I'm sure it has been done with the best intentions, is that the infrastructure that is that is needed to support some of these things, like the you know creation of a digital identity, for example, or the be able to uh, or the ability to be able to actually obtain an uh, uh, a correct birth certificate, have all been contributing factors. Um, to the inability of people to be able to access financial services. And what we find is that, you know, these owners, owners KYC requirements, as an example, um, provide, a, provide a, a visible barrier um, to entry for most of the financially excluded. Um, if you think about it this way, how many uh, people that are that live in a rural area or township where a road name doesn't exist might be able to provide a proof of address, for example? These are important things to consider when developing um, when developing regulatory uh, when regulatory policy, particularly for the financially excluded segment. Cool, um, but I think it's also important to. Uh, um, to delve deep into how fintechs are actually um, delivering on um, on this and, and and capitalizing on some of these solutions uh, on some of these obstacles, and and just really rolling off that, like over the past decade, we've seen a lot of uh, fintechs coming in and delivering very unique and innovative solutions that address um, a myriad of facets of um, of financial inclusion. Here, I think uh, when we talk about how they're going about it. That's a really interesting part. And um, they're, they're almost like two uh, different sides of the same coin. So when we talk about the obstacles that, that uh, Riyadh uh, addressed, um, the, the, in, like the advantage that they have as fintechs is exactly the, the opposite of that, right? And they've really shown how they're innovating in, in some of these spaces. I think like a really good example was uh, Riyadh mentioned here is like showing um, proof of address um, where you live in a rural area. Um, and one way that fintechs have come and gone about this is that they, they have produced um, tailored standards for KYC, and these usually tend to be lower um, than what are required by banks or tiers, depending on tiered, depending on the amount that you want to access. Um, and with that, they've actually worked hand in hand with uh, regulators to be able to develop new, new regulation that is able to address like these niche markets, right? Um, the tiered KYC or digital KYC, e-money are all really interesting examples um, that have come out of, of this uh, back and forth. And I think that speaks to the identification of systemic exclusionary regulation. Um, within that, like when they're having these discussions, they have they sit with regulators knowing that the imperative is about financial inclusion in the broader sense, right? And whether it is um, saying that we want to provide um, uh, services for SMEs or farmers or people who don't have access to, to formal credit, they come with um, very specific um, mission-driven business models and very specific um, product sets in mind, right? So as they go about building um, their solutions, they have this intentionality um, around the business set, around the business model, about how to reduce the cost of service because they know that the people that they're trying to address need scalable um, low cost, um, readily available, accessible um, products for, for them, right? And part of the thing that they've done is then leverage a lot of the technology that either exists or, or building their own technology to do that. And I think that spoke very well to, to Riyadh's point about like not using legacy systems um, to, do, to do a job that it was not intended to do, right? Um, and I think a really, really interesting example of that um, is then how they've innovated specifically in the, in the data space. So the access to and the use um, and the provision of alternative data for more inclusive products, right? Um, especially for financial, financial technology and things at scale, rather than having to like fill out a form and ask about somebody's history, they're able to um, ask for your social media data or your mobile money data or your calling, your calling history. And from that provide products that are best suited for you. Um, to, to address some of some of your problems. I think with that, like these are all very common characteristics that we see within financial technology solutions, um, but they vary in the application of it, right? And um, a common thread that we see with all of these 
is that they seem to be very simple, but yet very intentional um, in their offerings. And as a result, we have um, multi-inclusionary benefits for, for the financially excluded. A really great example of this, um, which we're gonna use as a case study is Yoko. Great. So I so I think up until now, well, all of the stuff that we've talked uh, that we've talked about has been really um, uh, super theoretical. But really, here's how um, you know the the definition of financial inclusion really seems to be failing most people. So um, in in South Africa, which is arguably one of the most included when it comes to the traditional definition of financial uh, uh, in, uh, inclusion. Um, in South Africa is uh, is being that you know while seventy percent of the population have access to a bank card for example and and access to a bank account only eight percent of businesses in South Africa are physically able to accept um, card or or electronic payments and when you think about this in the context of small to medium um, size enterprises, which are the largest employers by far, but are also the great one of the greatest contributors to GDP, um, is that this is a major failing in uh, in what financial inclusion is or financial inclusion should be. Um, I think it's also important to know that you know while um, while historically you know traditional financial services providers have really treated um, financial inclusion um, as a sort of um, uh, uh, uninvestable or uh, uh, the cost of risk is far too high to uh, to outweigh the the reward or the investment in order to be able to reach some of these people um, is that is that there is a, a significant market opportunity here um, and in South Africa, that represents one, well, 155 billion rand worth of consumer payments that uh, are there and are currently being untapped or unserved uh, by traditional financial services providers in, mo in the majority of cases because of the manner in which the, the, these financial services are being provided. Cool. And so I think, you know, the, the Yoko model speaks to being able to build uh, financial services around the needs of these customers. The first, obviously, is acknowledging the need for access to payments. But the the idea and you know financial inclusion beyond this is really being um, an approach of how do we build and develop products that add um, and are customer centric and add to um, and and speak to the customer's financial journey. And whether that is need for capital or funding and the utilization of um, alternative sources of data in order to be able to credit score those those merchants um, or um, you know be able to uh, generate a, uh, a digital footprint that merchants are able to leverage in order to access traditional financial services beyond Yoko um, is really what uh, we intend on reorientating um, the, the definition of financial inclusion actually to be around. Tool. And and then the last bit I think also is just really um, you know when when attempting to solve some of these problems that we actually seek to solve the underlying issues that are affecting um, you know financial inclusion more broadly and when when we talk about you know uh, being able to um, uh, access financial support or capital we're really talking about the lack of availability of data um, alternative uses. Um, alternative sources of data and being able to utilize those um, and looking at people's payments behavior, for an example, uh, Mobiana spoke about uh, social media um, and mobile money data um, and, the, and making those, uh, firstly, understanding the risk and, they, and pricing against that then allows, you know, knock on consequences of, uh, you know, addressing issues of inaccessibility or unaffordability of digital payments, and it has a knock-on effect um, in the amount of people that might be allowed to be able to access those type of traditional financial services. And what that means is that we then address, um, you know, the 95% of transactions that are not, that are currently not happen happening on digital platforms. And, you know, also develop credit histories for businesses and SMEs that they're able to leverage to go on um, to obtain even more uh, further funding or be able to employ further people um, and, you know, uh, uh, and perhaps even graduate onto 
um, more traditional financial services. But I think that this requires, and I think it will speak to the next slide um, as we go on, um, is just really, we need to shift the misperceptions that currently exist within the market, particularly around um, this segment. And I promise that this is the last slide, but um, you know, it, it's really one around an acknowledgement of the magnitude about of Africa's unbanked population, but, but more than that, what are the lived realities that each of these people face on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, and actually seeking to provide, um, to provide product services and customer tools um, that have failed um, uh, in, in most business models up until now. And also, you know, addressing this perceived risk um, that Finan the financially excluded pros are higher risk to the financial ecosystem merely because we simply don't understand them or are not prepared to use utilize the all of the data that is available to us um, in order to be able to to properly do that what we think um, that this reorientation does is allow for scalable financial services um, to hopefully be able to one address uh, Africa's uh, financial inclusion um, problem but also you know extend to onto other emerging markets, but also really uh, create a model that seeks to address and design workable solutions that go beyond simply just providing bank accounts and, the, and addressing the traditional, uh, the traditional definition of what financial inclusion means, and, in, and then instead enables true financial inclusion, which is really around you know, how we are able to deliver an inclusive and sustainable um, ecosystem for uh, for Africans. So we really look forward to, um, to you uh, reading through the, through the paper, but there was just a little bit of a teaser um, to get you started and give you a little bit of background around, um, you know, what our thought process has been um, in, in, in coming to some of these conclusions that we've, um, that we, that we've explored. Thank, Thank you, so you very much. much. All right. Thank you very much, Ria. Thank you very much to Melo for uh, that present presentation, very insightful presentation. And I think I really did enjoy reading your paper. Um, I know the rest don't have access to it, but I really did enjoy reading your paper. And what stood out to me is, you know, this uh, need to access the advanced and undeserved populations. And I have interacted with the Yoko app once, just anecdotally, just anecdotal here. And it was with a small business that um, he was selling books, just a pop-up business, he was selling books. And I didn't have cash on me, it was an impromptu buy for me. And I was like, oh my God, I only have my card. And he you know, came out with a small, you know, like, oh, thank God, because I really wanted the book. And so it is actually reaching certain populations and you know, helping the economy, if I could say so. But I wonder, you have talked about some of the resistance and issues of acceptance. And here you are, I think, also facing competition from more established banks who already have their own payment systems. I wonder, as Yoko, how do you confront that? And while you go there, I know you did define financial inclusion. Maybe you should have also started by defining what is a fintech. Uh, for those who are not so <laughs> tech savvy here, what is a fintech and how does it now go into financial inclusion, which you already defined? Thank you. Sure, um, maybe I'll take this. Um, so uh, fintech has come to mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but in the broader sense is really any sort of uh, technology company that, utilize, that utilizes some form um, of technology, whether there's AI, machine learning, alternative credit scoring mechanisms or algorithms, um, to be able to provide financial services that, um, uh, that might or might not be uh, available in any particular market. I think, you know, um, you know going, going back to your point, and I think also a point that has been raised in the, the chat around trust and fees has been really the differentiator uh, for us in terms of what Yoko's value uh, proposition has been. One, I think, so, so, so I, th I think there's two issues that fundamentally need to be addressed. One is really around, you know, the, this issue of trust is that there's an inherent distrust that exists um, in, uh, in traditional financial services um, in, Afri in Africa and, you know, at, and within emerging markets as a whole. So I think an acknowledgement of that um, is important. And I think it's also the reason that you will never ever see 
uh, a fintech ever call themselves a bank. Even the ones that are in banking re really prefer to call themselves neobanks. And so I think attempt to steer clear of that, uh, of that label as much as possible. I know we certainly have. So I think that that's the first important thing. The second thing is around access, is that you know for the vast majority of the merchants that Yoko serves, roughly around 70 to 80% of them would not have been able to access that same financial service from a bank basically because they're deemed too high risk. The person that you bought a book from, I think is an ideal example, is that with the monthly fees that the person earns, um, the devices uh, and the rental fees that, the, that a bank might have charged um, to provide that device to that merchant would simply make it not feasible for him to have it in the first place. So I think there's that. And then I think there's a third aspect, which is really around understanding the underlying issues that, are, that underpin some of these. Um, these issues, which is really around, you know, understanding the customer. Um, and this is really around where alternative types of data is important, is that if you, if you are utilizing alternative ty types of data, you're able to get a, hopefully be able, if you're clever enough and to get a better understanding of, um, of the customer, one that would not be, um, would not fit within the traditional credit scoring models uh, or, or risk tolerances of a bank and therefore be able to better pr uh, price for it. And as a result of that, be able to drive down the fees, which is what we're seeing with most fintechs, right? Is that the cost to serve these customers um, are much lower than any bank because of the one, the model in which uh, um, the, the system can be rolled out. So over um, existing infrastructure like e-money, for example, uh, is one, but also are uh, also able to reduce the cost because they have a better view of the actual risk that the customer poses um, and not as and, and not a, a perceived risk based on their gold standard of what they think credit scoring should look like. Um, right. But I think all of those things are contributing factors. All right. Thank you, Tumelo. One minute. Uh, we need to move to the next presenter. So I'll give you one minute to give a final word. Um, I think Riyadh stole, stole the, the show there. Um, <laughs> is there anything I'd love, I'd love to add there? Yeah, I just think from, from my, my experience uh, across it, I think Riyadh touched on a lot of the points. Like it's a, it's a very intricate marriage between um, the private sector, the government, um, the, the fintechs that come into this. Um, and it's really about just understanding and meeting the customer, customer where, they're, where they're at, right? And being extremely intentional about it. Um, I think there needs to be like a willingness and openness for all of the players um, around how things are changing and really understanding who, who they are and, and for change as well, right? Because we might come with our perceived uh, notions about what the solution might be, but once we speak to um, the, the, the regulators, other players in the market, customers, um, things, things are, are ever evolving. Um, but I think what I found is really important around like addressing financial inclusion is um, customer centricity um, and that's across all players and I think are willing to bend in in um, to assure that the customer is the one that's being served and the customer is first right um, despite what all the players might come with their their um, their opinions all right thank you very much Mbiana, for that thank you very much Riyadh for your presentation um, for everybody else, as I said, their paper is available in our digital magazine and you can read the full paper there. And having read it, I can assure you it's an amazing paper. Thank you very much. So we are going to move to our second presenter. This is uh, Rachel Cheng. Her presentation is on data governance and African perspective. Over to you, Rachel, please introduce yourself. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mary Stella. Um, my name is Rachel, as she has said. I am a research assistant at the Center for Intellectual Property and Information Technology Law, CPIT, in Strathmore University in Nairobi, Kenya. I'm also an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, and my areas of my areas of focus are digital rights, um, data governance, and data protection. So I will attempt to cover everything in 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, and um. I'll be breaking down what data governance is, why it's important um, from an, data governance from an African perspective, data governance principles that are being applied globally and within the continent, challenges and gaps and what to be considered when filling these gaps. 
So we now live in a world where all the services, even the most basic ones, have been digitized. This applies to both um, the public and the private sectors and to all industries. In healthcare, we have apps and accessories that monitor our health, like um, our heartbeat rate. In hospitals, e-health and m-health systems are being um, set up to collect, process, and manage health data. In education, um, edtech is being adopted everywhere. In finance, and especially due to and during the pandemic, more and more people are adopting mobile and online banking, and you no longer have to queue at the bank to access banking um, services. We have seen the same in agriculture and basically everyday practices. A lot of data is being collected on a daily basis by businesses, organizations, and institutions. And this calls for the need to better understand and govern data through the collection, processing, and retention stages. We need to ask more questions on how data is being collected, why it is being collected, how it is being processed, how it is retained, and what safeguards are put in place to ensure its protection. And that is what data governance is about. So traditionally, data governance was viewed as a technology and a business concept. It is becoming a more relevant conversation in the legal field with human rights at the center of how we run things. And especially in light of um, conversations that are being had around data protection and privacy laws. Uh, due to its, its multidisciplinary nature, the definition varies by discipline, but the core remains consistent. So what exactly is data governance? Uh, the Data Governance Institute defines it as a system of decision rights and accountabilities for information related processes executed according to agreed upon models, which describe who can take the actions with what information and when under what circumstances using what methods. The Data Management Association International also defines it as the planning, oversight, and control over management of data and the use of data and data-related resources, sources. So um, in simplest terms, um, data governance basically means um, models and measures that define who has the authority to do what, when, where, and how, with what data. Uh, it looks at the rules and responsibilities and processes, and it also covers the entire data management life cycle. So it requires companies to establish processes, procedures, and standards. From a technological standpoint, we're looking at apps and services and their data management standards. From an economic standpoint, we're looking um, at the digital economy, how data is used, and how we can maximize its value if we really need to. Um, from a security standpoint, we are examining the privacy and security of data held by organizations, businesses, and institutions, as well as safeguards in place to ensure privacy. And from a, from a legal and human rights standpoint, we're examining the protection of human rights, the right to privacy, international personal data transfer, or cross-border data transfer, and the various laws that apply in various jurisdictions and regions. And this is where data governance principles come in. So they can be grouped into four. There's organization, um, alignment, compliance, and common understanding. And the uh, organization, when developing data governance frameworks, the organization's ob objectives always come first. It's important to consider organizational dimensions and to specify the framework for decision rights and accountability in order to promote desired data use behaviors. Um, in alignment, uh, basically covers um, what data meets, how data meets the business needs. And under compliance monitoring and enforcement, uh, we try to make sure that the different entities comply with national, regional, and international laws. And a common understanding, the one question that needs to be asked is, does everyone within the organization understand why you're collecting data, how it is being processed, managed, and retained? So essentially what this means is that there should be integrity in all the dealings. There should be transparency in understanding how and when data-related decisions and controls were integrated into the processes. And um, there should also be an audit of data-related decisions, processes, and controls accompanied by documentation that satisfy regulatory and operational auditing requirements. And there should also be a well-defined accountability and responsibility for 
data related decisions and controls. Of course, um, there have been challenges in the adoption of technology. And according to the Open Barometer, Open Data Barometer, African Edition Report 2019, on open data readiness, use, and impact in Africa, a few of the challenges listed are applicable to the data governance space at the moment. Among them are um, uh, the majority of African countries do not have a comprehensive open data governance guidelines, technical standards, or management procedures. Where there are laws and regulations, as you can see, um, uh, countries in the East, Africa, countries in the West Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa are trying to look into um, data protection, laws and regulations. They exist, yes, but they continue to lag behind the rapidly changing data ecosystem. Additionally, the majority of governments and public official, officials face significant challenges when it comes to embracing and implementing new technologies. And lastly, when it comes to the general public, um, who are better known as data subjects, when it comes to data protection, there's a dearth of digital literacy and an obvious digital divide. After having explained all this, three questions may come to mind. One, why does data governance matter? Two, why do we need data governance frameworks? And three, why should human rights be at the core of data governance frameworks? As I had previously explained, individuals, businesses, and organizations are all affected in some way. To protect data subjects' rights, to ensure privacy and security, and to comply with regulatory requirements outlined in the laws and standards, data governance is necessary. It is also important in ensuring um, better, more comprehensive decision support based on consistent, uniform data across um, organizations, as well as establishing clear rules for changing processes and data that aid um, businesses and IT in becoming more scalable. Uh, data governance is a broad term and it encompasses uh, legal and human rights requirements, as well as technological security and economic concerns. Uh, this guides the management of data within an organization and establishes the principles uh, that guide the development of frameworks. And in order for us to make this a reality, it is necessary to bridge the existing divide between the disciplines of IT, business, and law. Uh, public education is necessary to increase public awareness, uh, digital literacy, and um, the understanding of uh, what rights they are entitled to. And it is also necessary to strengthen administrative systems and expand access to information and technology. Uh, in conclusion, therefore, um, we as CPIT, uh, we have been uh, doing this research for the whole year and we have been involving stakeholders as well. And we have come to the conclusion that there is a great gap that needs to be filled in establishing data governance frameworks for Africa and um, understanding data governance in the African perspective. Yeah, that is all. Thank you very much, Rachel. And uh, what you have concluded is actually very true in terms of the absence of uh, data frameworks in Africa and the need to strengthen these uh, data frameworks, which are there. And even when there's there, there's a challenge of enforcement. But I'm not going to pose any questions to you right now because I'm running behind time. I want to introduce Sumaya to do her, Sumaya Hussein to make her presentation because there's a lot of similarity. There is some similarity between your presentation and her presentation. Sumaya, unfortunately, I think you need to really keep it, uh, you know, within the 15 minutes time. I know she has mentioned some of the things already in your paper. You can skip that and then just focus on the gist of your paper. And so as an introduction, we have Sumaya Hussein next. She's going to introduce herself more. Her paper is on China's mass surveillance technologies in exchange for African spatial data sets, a win-win situation or not. Over to you, Sumaya. I see you're trying to share your screen, but we can't see it as yet, and you're still muted. Possibly unmute yourself. Great. Um, all right. Uh, let me know if you can see my screen. Well, we can see you, but we can't see your screen as yet. Yes, now we can see your screen. 
All right, okay. Um, thank you, Mary Stella, for that kind introduction. Um, my name is Sumaya Noor, and I'm a third year in law school. I go to Strathmore University. I have major interest in the intersections between artificial intelligence, its governance, and how that can relate to the law, especially when it comes to human rights. So um, Rachel has definitely done a great job in saving me the time to explain what, what standards needs to be used when it comes to um, data protection laws. So basically, my main research question is whether um, whether China's mass surveillance technologies uh, and the deals that it's having with African countries through the One Belt and One Road Initiative, in fact, is a win-win uh, situation. So in order to understand this, we have to look at two things. One is an understanding of what we, can, what we what is known as the One Belt and One Road Initiative, which I will be referring to as BRI. And two is an understanding of facial recognition, AI, and mass surveillance technologies. So when it comes to BRI, BRI is basically a multinational project by China that is trying to make its influence and ex extend its influence to the rest of the world. And when it comes to Africa, um, surprisingly, 52 out of um, 53, uh, 53, 54 countries have already become a part of this initiative. So some of the main sectors of BRI include transport, power and energy. Um, some of the famous projects as associated with BRI include uh, the Nairobi Mombasa railway gauge and the Karuma hydropower project in Uganda. So the, the, the unfortunate thing is like China has had a huge influence when it comes to its presence in Africa, but we don't hear much about it, especially when it comes to matters regarding mass surveillance technologies. So when we look at facial recognition AI and mass surveillance technologies, one of the main focus here is that um, AI is hugely being integrated into many sectors of uh, um, different technologies. So, and mass surveillance is no exception. But um, when we look at China, it has already made its, um, it has already declared itself that by 2030, it wants to be a global center for AI and, and uh, it should be a huge dependent for the rest of the world. So when it comes to mass surveillance technologies that are using facial recognition technologies, not just China, but the rest of the world, one of the huge problems they face is that they have an issue when it comes to accurate identification and verification of people of color. And this stems from the fact that um, there's lack of diversity when it comes to the data sets that are being used to train these technologies. So the data sets being used are predominantly that of white people. Um, once these technologies have been trained and are deployed in the real world, there's a high chance that they will probably identify uh, give a correct identification or verification of a white person compared to a person of color. So this research question looks at um, this deal from two, uh, from two lenses, if I, if I may say so. So the first lens is a minimum threshold framework. And I will go straight to the point here because um, Rachel has done an exceptional job when it comes to understanding data protection laws and how we have very weak data protection laws in, in Africa. But when specifically we talk about images and collection of images, it's biometric form of data collection. And when it comes to collection of biometric data, there's a minimum threshold that at least any law that is providing for the collection of this type of data should meet. And that is consent and transparency, which means that any individual whose image is being used and collected should be aware of that their image is being collected. It doesn't just end there, it goes further to transparency whereby the individual should be able to get answers to questions such as who is collecting this image? Why are they collecting it? To what extent is it being used? Is there a third party involved? And when is this data going to be disposed of? The second framework is a human rights framework. And um, <clears throat> sorry. And in this framework, the paper uh, looks critically analyzes the fact that a lot, um, all African countries, in fact, have ratified the different United Nations human rights conventions. And this means that they've assimilated, they have assimilated obligations to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights. It doesn't just end there because we have special rapporteurs and resolutions that have, that have been put out there when it comes to the protection of human rights in the, in the era of new technologies. So their research uh, looks at the problem from this framework. Using this then, I make two arguments. 
One is that it's not yet a win-win situation for two main reasons. One, the data protection laws in most African countries have not met the minimum threshold to guarantee the safety of the facial IDs of Africans. So a case in point in Zim is Zimbabwe, whereby now China's cloud work, cloud work company has entered into a contract with China and with Zimbabwe, whereby they will be collecting um, facial IDs of Zimbabweans for the exchange of highly subsidized and what they consider as high-end mass surveillance technologies. So according to them, that is definitely a win-win a win situation because they're able to uh, they're able to fill in the gap of um, um, what is it called data that is uh, diversified data. So for them, it is a win-win situation. But when you look at African states and case in point Zimbabwe, it does not even have policies that provide for and recognize biometric data as any form of data that should be protected. There's no such policy, which means each minimum issues of consent and transparency will not be addressed. Um, the second problem is that when we look at this from a human rights perspective and the human rights implications that the use of these technologies have, then it's truly not a win-win situation for Africa yet. Why? Because first, these technologies are a huge violation of core rights such as non-discrimination non and human dignity. For instance, these mass surveillance technologies back in China have been used to segregate and target Muslim minorities. And when you look at African countries who uh, become beneficiaries, beneficiaries of these same mass surveillance technologies, you see that for instance, in Ethiopia, the government has been using this technology to target minority, uh, min the minority ethnic group of er Oromo, we have even in Zimbabwe where it's been used to silence political minority and <clears throat> we have Uganda where it's being used to uh, also target political minorities and that is not the end of the list. So up to this juncture, we understand there's only one party that is on a win situation. And if anything, any African state that is going to think that they're benefiting from this type of deals is truly at a loss. So there are three propositions that I make in this paper in order to potentially make these types of deals, um, potentially make these types of deals one that is uh, one that is fair and beneficial to either parties. So the first recommendation is a national recommendation whereby um, this has come from the assessment of different states and the steps they've taken. And one of the outstanding uh, choices that have been made um, stem from the US and Australia, whereby in fact they've said, since there are no policies that have met or I yet have already met the minimum threshold and they can't guarantee the safety of their people when it comes to collection of biometric data, then they will ban the use of this technology until such policies are put in place. The second solution is a bilateral solution. It might actually be mo the most straightforward solution um, when compared to banning of uh, these technologies. Because <laughs> even though 24 African countries, as Rachel has already said, have police data protection policies, those policies lack major, majorly lack um, implementation mechanism and some of them have no recognition for biometric data. But the African Union's um, Convention on Cyber Security and Personal Data Protection, in fact, expressly provides for this minimum threshold. It provides that any country that ratifies this convention should be able to seek the consent and provide for the transparency whenever collecting biometric data. Unfortunately, only eight African countries so far have ratified this convention. So the solution here is that if other African countries are motivated to ratify this convention, this could be a huge chance and an opportunity for them to have some form of protection uh, by, being, by ratifying this convention and being bound by it as they develop their own domestic laws, especially when it comes to biometric data. Um, the last solution is a multi multilateral solution. And it mainly stems from the African continental free trade area. Um, this uh, preposition has a higher range of impact and is a new form of development for different African states. Uh, this is because the African continental free trade uh, area has been already signed by more than three quarter of African countries and all its protocols are still undergoing some form of negotiation. But this solution will stem from the investment protocol of the African continental, um, African continental free trade area. Um, so basically the solution here is that um, 
the investment protocol should be able to provide for basic guidelines when it comes to international investments. In this case, BRI, which is a form of investment, and in fact, the African Union itself has entered, entered, in a, entered into an MOU with, uh, BRI, um, with China through BRI, which means it has recognized the ki these kinds of investment across different African states. It will be perfect during this um, investment protocol of the of the African continental trade, uh, they could introduce policy, um, policies that should be able to guide um, international investment, and they should also be able to outline some of the um, some of the core values of human rights should also be respected in um, by all African states if they want to be if they want to um, if they want to acknowledge those those types of investments. Um, Yes, and that, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Sumaya, for that uh, presentation. I really enjoyed your presentation and also enjoyed your paper. And now we can also see the, the similarities between your paper and Rachel's paper. And I think I'll pose uh, one question to both of you. So for Rachel, you've talked about, you know, the lack of data frameworks and the lack of enforcement, which also Sumaya has reiterated. But in terms of trends, as CP, what are you seeing as trends? Are you optimistic when it comes to the trends you see with these frameworks and the, the advocacy for strengthening these frameworks? So in that, in that case, are you seeing optimism when it comes to data governance in Africa, or it's more of the other, it's the other side of the coin that we're looking to. And then to Sumaya, uh, thank you very much for that. And your presentation actually reminds me of uh, something Yuval Harari stated in his book about you know, 21 lessons of the 21st century, where he talked about how increasingly we see in Africa and other contexts that we are seeing this increased uh, collaboration between Africa and China. And China is not particularly a country that is known for having a good human rights record, but more so with countries moving towards China and away from other traditional partners, if I could call them in the global north. And this has implications, including what you've mentioned in your paper. Just moving forward, it also reiterates a question that uh, Brian has, has asked in the chat, which is he's considering, I figure, what is the cost of this increased collaboration? What is the cost of this? And largely from the paper, I say it's more of a, it's not a win-win situation, especially for Africa. And Brian continues on to say, if the lawmakers, officials between the African and Chinese government fill each other's pockets and allows this capturing of biometrics, will the average person walking in the street have a choice to say, camera on the lamp pole, you're not allowed to scan my face. Um, it will be very interesting to understand the practicalities of the data protection frameworks. I hope you can address that. And Mumbiani also mentions, I think there's also a big question about the benefits for the African people. And even if African governments were to argue the benefit as a state, um, how are these benefits shared or passed down to the people? So here we are looking at how does it help me as an African? And I think when you're trying to address that, think about, because one of the justifications is usually national security, public order, prevention of crime. And so sometimes when you package that very well, especially let's say in a context like Kenya where there's been terrorism attacks, some people can say, okay, fine, let me, what does it mean? It's just a bit of my privacy is gone, but if it's going to stop this, then well and good, but that's packaging, how the state can package that and does not actually explore how our privacy is being um, infringed upon. So how do you balance these two aspects? Uh, and then finally, Gasho says here, thank you for the presentation. My question is one about best policy regulation of technologies or prohibition or banning since it could have an implication for investment and other benefits. Thank you. Um, finally, Jerome posts another question. So I'm sorry, I'm throwing all this to you because I don't have time to go one by one. So I am trusting on your intellect to be able to sift through all these questions and answer them. And so there's another question there from Courtney. So, but good presentation. How about control of good application of all these texts and protocol to be ensured that they are well protected overall? So all these questions I've thrown to you, please find a way to answer them. Two minutes, two minutes each. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Stella. I can start. Um, so we are optimistic um, about the data protection, data governance, um, privacy laws and regulations that we're seeing um, coming up all across Africa. However, there is a flip side to it because 
seemingly um, it's only the stakeholders that are are having these conversations. But at the end of the day, we also need to remember that the data subjects who are at the very grassroots also need to understand what it entails when they give out their data, um, what data processing means, what rights they have and all that. So yes, we are optimistic, but we also need to create awareness to the public in regards to this. Thank you, Rachel. Um... There's also a last question posted over to you. You can respond to it in the chat box, please. So Maya, over to you. I'm going to answer the question on implications and what, what options will, I, will, will I suggest um, from this other end? So when it comes to implications, when it comes to matters of investments, um, from the research I have done so far, it's definitely regulated by the policies that exist. So um, as African countries, they should definitely uh, stand ground in some of the policies and the terms they do put forth when it, when, when it comes to some of the investments they take up because China has had its own long standing history, has, it had, its, has had its own uh, power balance when it comes to matters of technology and even democracy. However, I wouldn't think uh, African countries will, will, however, make that as their own personal agenda to make changes in that, but rather be able to uh, stand strong when it comes to the types of policies and the types of investments and, and on which terms they would like to engage. Um, and on the question of um, whether, whether it's a ban, what implications these investments will have, um, as I was writing the paper, definitely a balance of both, because you, you, um, these kinds of investments, for sure, when you look at the data protection laws and from the human rights perspective laws, it's not a savior hand. It's not a free. It's, it's what are you trading in exchange for? What type of sacrifice are you willing to make at this instance that you will pay? And um, this this famous quote that goes around that data is the new form of oil. So you really need to protect it and guard it with everything that you have. So whether a ban, whether good policies, there needs to be um, quite a moderation and um, well, well thought out processes that the government needs to take. And there should be no excuses for that because data is truly the new oil. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sumaya, for that and for the quick uh, response. There's also another question for you in the app, uh, in the chat box, but please just respond to him in the chat box so that I can move on to the next uh, presentation. Again, as I told everybody, these papers will be available in our digital magazine, and so you can interact with the paper further. Uh, our final presentation uh, deviates a bit from the issue of data governance and financial institutions, and we go to an issue of fact-checking and fake news, which you know is another hot subject, and it's actually going to be um, explored more tomorrow in two sessions, one with, that we have done in collaboration with Facebook and another one where we are looking at elections and information disorder in the context of technology. But to give us a teaser of this, I have Mikhail Stojanowski. Uh, please correct me if I have butchered your name, I will apologize. Um, his topic is on the relative success of fact-checking services in combating fake news. Over to you, Mikhail, please introduce yourself and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Maristela. Actually, uh, that was a surprisingly well pronunciation of my name. I have to, I have to, I have to give it to you. Uh, people usually do a way worse job. So um, thank you. I was listening for to the other presentations before mine, and I will try to do this in the spirit of of what Maristela said, basically to give you a teaser of the topic instead of like a thorough analysis of, of the whole situation because um, I am the assistant manager of the European Roma Rights Center in Brussels, but I also work as a freelance human rights consultant. Uh, I, used to, I used to work for the European Court of Human Rights, and this is sort of the topic on which I focused in my work there. And uh, what I pursue currently as research at the University of Strasbourg. So uh, regulation of fake news and how different types of regulation impact freedom of expression. So uh, any of these topics, uh, if anyone feels you have anything to discuss or to collaborate on, on any of these things, please uh, feel free to write me. I will, my email will be at the, um, at the uh, last slide. So I think I should now share the screen. 
and start my presentation but i think i need to go through like this first and only then click on share screen and go like like this you see my presentation so my yes, i you. see okay perfect perfect thank you so uh, i'm not going to take a lot of your time uh so the the key issue here is how societies decided to um fight fake news there's no need to introduce fake news disinformation misinformation all the terminological differences which exist about that different institutions have defined it differently um different topics have been discussed in different international instruments by different stakeholders etc but we don't know we don't need to go into that at the moment so let's just uh jump into the topic that of 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 fact checking this has been the most reasonable and the, the most uh, logical response to the appearance or rather uh, resurgence of fake news in, in um, uh, the uh, post-truth world, especially after 2016 and uh, several elections which were held around the world. But one key issue which, uh, in, in spite of, of, of great success achieved by fake fact checkers, namely the whole Pizzagate scandal in, in, in Washington, in the United States. Then there was the issue about uh, the French President Macron having uh, accounts in overseas before the elections in France. All of these things uh, were fact-checked and the truth was established. But there are, so there are undeniable benefits from fact-checking and we know that there is a problem. There are fact-checkers, which are usually independent organizations, subsidized by someone, paid by someone, that they can immediately check what is true and then present the truth. And in an ideal world, this would counteract the, init the initial um, news that was damaging to, to, to freedom of expression. But, however, this really depends on an assumed rationality of the average news consumer. This means that um, I see fact A, fact A is proven as false, then I, um, I discontinue my belief in fact A, and then the world is a better place. Unfortunately, this is not how it works. And now we come to the inherent limits of fact-checking, which is, well, some events are simply difficult, borderline impossible to fact-check. Although this is a minority, in my modest opinion, of facts, there is still the example of, the, of uh, Mr. Klaus Relotius, who was a journalist, for Der Spiegel in Germany, who back, if I'm not mistaken, in 2020 was uh, discovered to have fabricated or half fabricated and completely made up dialogues with, with people all over the world, one of which was a conversation that he allegedly had with a refugee child um, from Syria in, in a uh, border town on, in, in Turkey. And yeah, no one, no one could fact check this because he claimed that this happened on one specific day, on one specific place, behind the, any cameras and very far from any possibility. Uh, so th these things become impossible to fact check. But those are, uh, let's say, uh, not that big amount of, of, of facts overall. We have bigger issues with fact checking, which are the issues of reach and confirmation bias. I'm not a sociologist nor a psychologist. I do human rights. So confirmation bias in as far as I understand <laughs> means that what you believe, you will continue to believe and you are prone to seeking arguments and holding opinions which confirm your initial thoughts on the matter. So it, uh, it's very difficult to change an existing opinion, much more difficult than to maintain an existing opinion. As to the issue of reach, uh, this was an example which I actually addressed in, in, an, in a paper which I published in Sarajevo in Bosnia and Herzegovina about um, there was violence in early 2020 against the Roma community in Paris, in France, which was started by a fake news rumor which was spread online. And it was spread, uh, if I remember correctly, something like 70,000 times. The police retracted, um, immediately contradicted that fact that there was a kidnapping of XYZ child in some part of Paris. 
that there had been no report of any children missing at the, at the critical time. But this piece of news was shared seven, 800 times. So, and by completely different profiles sometimes. This is, this is, these are fields which require further research, but these are some of the problems that fact, checking, fact checkers are, are, are dealing with and why their effects have been limited so far. So what could we use as alternatives? Because fact checking, although being the most logical response to fake news, yet there is, there seems to be, we still have to, we still uh, appear to be dealing with fake news. And if uh, not an increasing level, then at least not, there is no decrease. I mean, we are still dealing with the same problem. Um, so media literacy could be something that is super efficient. Uh, introducing media literacy into school curricula, teaching children about how to discern fact from uh, falsity, um, how, which skills are needed for this, how to recognize what could be trusted, what should be doubted, what sh how to double, triple check information before they share. This is great, but the problem with, with media literacy uh, initiatives are that they take time, they take years if not decades to materialize in any measurable uh, success one such case has been finland where this has been done and it's ongoing for five years now and uh, finland was declared recently the most uh, fake news resilient country in europe uh, there is a correlation there uh, probably causation as well um, but this is something that we need to keep investing in and exploring Self-regulation of big technology companies is also an option, but this was tried in several, uh, in several countries. Uh, Germany initiated this in 2017, and the success was middling. I mean, as far as I um, uh, could understand the reasons of the German legislators at the time, which then that, that self-regulating initiative snowballed into, into something much bigger. So I was following those events a lot. Um, they were not, they were simply not, uh, the legislators in Germany were simply not satisfied with the outcome and the effects that self-regulation uh, had, even though it was really encouraged. So then they decided to change their approach and enact the uh, Nets DG, which is one of the um, uh, most interesting uh, domestic laws when it comes to fake news regulation, but that's a different topic. And uh, the third and most uh, let's say, used measure lately are takedown measures of content on social media, on content on the internet in general. And uh, these can be ordered by a court or a third party or be done through intermediary regulation, which is a more specific type of takedown. Um, a segment of intermediary regulation is also takedown measures. Uh, meaning that social media would be prompted and at least at first instance, they would resolve any conflicts which might exist as to content published on them, including, uh, including fake news. So to shorten this whole conversation, new approaches are necessary. And uh, all of these initiatives, which I mentioned before, should be attempted uh, should be put in a joint program, which would mean having a systemic approach, which would be a long-term program by societies and also on a supranational level. We need international instruments for this. Uh, will fact-checking solve fake news? No. That's a clear no, in my opinion. But fact-checking will always play a crucial role within that systemic approach. And this means that we need to continue investing in the independent uh, fact-checking services. Uh, societies need to uh, promote such initiatives, uh, usually through grassroots organizations, instead of having a top-down approach, which is not usually looked very favorably upon because of uh, uh, freedom of expression issues. And fact-checking can always be used by third parties in whatever fake news policies are then um, enacted on national or supranational levels. So will fact-checking solve the problem that we're having? No, but it will play a crucial and essential role 
in any approach that we should seriously take. Because even in my opinion, the best approach, which is media literacy, highly depends on fact-checked information in the background. They all do every single approach. If you have a takedown measure in place, the the system or the persons doing the, 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 the takedowns or deciding on takedowns, they need to have fact-checked information so that they would know whether A is false or B is false. This is essential. So uh, to come back to the title of, 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 of my presentation, the effects of first generation uh, fact-checking were limited, although we expected much more. But I think that fact-checking services are now reforming. They're playing a broader role and they will be playing an even bigger role as part of a more systemic approach towards fake news. Um, I will not, I do not want to take any more of your time. So I know that we're all on a very tight schedule. So uh, uh, you are screen sharing, stop share. Yes, I believe we're done. Thank you. Yes, thank you okay. very much presentation i very much enjoyed it and i like the realism behind it you're very realistic in saying that no fact check it will not stop false news but i think it sort of dovetails with other strategies to manage false exactly news. And exactly. so when you talk about fact checking, there was and I felt there was it did lean towards you know fact checking by reliable organizations. I wonder whether you can talk about the fact checking by ordinary citizens because there's a crowd sort of correcting element that comes with fact checking. That fact checkers, more reliable organizations, while they are reliable, the fact that it's very easy for things to you know go viral. Sometimes yeah. relying on ordinary citizens to fact check in the comment section is actually what's contributes to managing that particular uh, information. Because at times I go to the comment section, I see somebody has put a link there. No, this is not true. Go to this link for more you know, credible information. So could you speak to that a bit? Mm -hmm. okay, so this is, uh, this is a very interesting thing that you're mentioning, but this is a, very, uh, this is a double edged sword, I have to say, because um, crowds, crowd wisdom is not, does not mean that the, the, is, is, it's always a correct Thing to do. I mean, historically speaking, crowds have done horribly, horribly bad things and have made horrible decisions. Um, this, it doesn't mean that it's always a good choice, but there is an element of fact checking by ordinary citizens, as you put it in comments, which is very important, uh, which, which means that under any piece of information, you get alternative options. So assuming that we have had media literacy implemented in schools this could work in that context that you see a piece of information and you're like your brain is already trained to think like hmm, it doesn't really mm, sounds fishy you go through the comments and you go aha uh -huh, okay aha uh -huh, oh two three four five people think this is wrong you read the other five sources and you see ah, i now i know so there is a beneficial element to this but it cannot be relied on as solely as as a, as like a soul, uh, the, the only good approach in these things. We need trained professionals because there are standards of scientific proof. I mean, mm -hmm. posting a link to something is just not enough because we know how the post-truth era works. There are whole news media outlets which are, which are mostly fake news on their own. So this is a very risky approach, but it could help if we have media literacy in, in a bundle there. Okay, that's fine. And here again, is it goes back to what you said here. We are assuming that we are developing rational beings because the, the social media has actually shown us that yeah. we are not all rational beings. Just because you give me factual information does not mean I will believe it. So we also have to now combat issues of belief, perseverance, what you said, confirmation bias, how we are supposed to dismantle echo chambers so that we are not stuck in these information silos yeah. that we are just listening to the same thing being trumpeted over and over again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I fully, I fully agree. I mean, I didn't even mention, I didn't even talk about uh, filter bubbles and uh, echo chambers. But this is like outside of, of the immediate topic of research. But um, imagine being uh, just having no access to any fact-checked information because this is how social media built the wall around you. I mean, this is a whole other topic, which makes the things even worse. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. Um... We, we could have talked about this the whole day, but we are limited in time. Let me just say thank you very much. There are some comments that have been addressed to you in the chat box. I, I wish you can just put us, you know, a quick short comment to address them so that I, I can just end this session by saying thank you to everyone. Thank you for the 
for the contributors, for your papers, for being here today to expound on your papers. You have made this session alive and I'm very grateful for your contributions. And I'm, I'm very eager for everybody else to interact with your papers as I have now properly in a digital platform in the digital magazine that we're going to publish. So thank you very much. And thank you everyone who has joined us for today's uh, first session. The next session will start in the next seven minutes. It's um, the panel on AI. Uh, that is going to be uh, moderated by Adebayo. He's a friend of the center, an alumni of the center. And so he has good things uh, ready for you. I am very eager for that, uh, for that session too. So we will take a short break for seven minutes and come back at 11.40 South African time, which I know is 12.40 East African time, but I cannot share the same for West Africa and all the other time zones. So I'll see you in the next seven minutes. Quick break, take some water, drink some tea. See you in seven minutes. Bye-bye.
Good morning, everyone. Iruna, thank you. A short break, but I hope um, that you are very excited to be here that you didn't even leave your computer so we can proceed and go ahead. Uh, the next session, as I said, is on AI and Africa, and it will be led by Adebayo, who is currently the, the heads of program African Office for Witness. This is a field that he's an expert in. We, he's an alumna of the center, so he's a good friend of the center, and I have seen his work and, uh, and the brilliant work that he's doing at Witness. And so he's the, he's the best person for this session, and we are very happy to have you here. Thank you for always coming back home. Absolutely a pleasure. Thanks, Marisa. Oh, it's good to, to you. see you. Good to see you too. Now possibly do a, a, a proper introduction of yourself, the work that you do, and the floor is yours. Absolutely. Um, it's good to have everybody here. Um, my name is Adibaya, like Mary Stella did say, um, the Africa Program Manager at Witness. And uh, Witness is a, a human rights organization that works at the intersection of video technology and human rights. Um, we're headquartered in New York, but we do have uh, regional programs crisscrossing Asia, Asia Pacific, the Middle East, Africa, um, as well as Latin America. Um, before I go deeper into um, the panel, which will be also joined by a number of other experts, glad to be able to introduce them along the line. There is a video that we would be playing um, that I actually did make to sort of um, anchor us in the conversation that we're having today. Um, so I would ask if the tech team can kindly uh, play that video and then we'll come right back. Stay glued, I think this would be worth your time. Can I get a confirmation, uh, maybe from Tiruna or Klengewe, that that will be going off? There's a lot of reasons to be. Technology has opened up a lot of opportunities, but at the same time has given us a lot of reasons to be concerned. I work at Witness, an international human rights organization that leverages the power of video and technology in the defense of human rights. And so what we do at Witness is that we support communities and activists to leverage the power of video in exposing injustice and pursuing accountability. However, over the past few years, there has been rising concern around the emergence of AI-enabled synthetic media. In other words, through the use of artificial intelligence, people are now able to more easily manipulate media. And that has us really worried. A lot of the use case scenarios of AI have been fun. And um, some of you might remember the app called Face App. Maybe some of you. Serena, do you think I should share my screen and probably play from here? Um, I'm sorry for the interruption in broadcasting the video. I'm currently having a bit of issues with my laptop. Um, Bio, if you could please play it from your side, you should be able to, and then I will have the next one ready. Thank you. Got it. Thanks. So we're talking about technology and we're having tech issues. Isn't that just amazing? <laughs> but just hang on a second. I'll just share my screen a bit. Can you all see, can somebody confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Technology has opened up a lot of opportunities, but at the same time has given us a lot of reasons to be concerned. I work at Witness, an international human rights organization that leverages the power of video and technology in the defense of human rights. And so what we do at Witness is that we support communities and activists to leverage 
the power causing injustice and pursuing however the media in other words through the use of artificial intelligence people are not able to more easily manipulate media and that has us really worried a lot of the use case scenarios of AI have been fun, and um, some of you might remember the app called Face App. Maybe some of you even played around with it. It's that app that allowed you to manipulate your photograph, including checking how you would look when you got much older. Um, so for now, some of the use case scenarios can be fun, and this is something that I also toyed around with using Face App. I definitely don't wear glasses. Uh, it doesn't look bad on me either. There is also Wumble, which is an app that allows you to use your picture to create a video of you lip syncing to a favorite song of yours, um, any song of your choice precisely. And I got the permission of my wife to create this Wumble, um, and the results had us both um, laughing and, you know, having fun over it. Never ending forever, baby. But while all of this can be fun, um, it also signals something a bit more dangerous, the decline of the truth. And here is a more sophisticated example of what I'm talking about. Here is a TikTok video of uh, the popular Hollywood actor, Tom Cruise, playing golf, except that it's actually not Tom Cruise. What's up, TikTok? You guys cool if I play some sports? I love it. Where's the audio experience? As much as the momentum. Hey, listen up, sports and TikTok fans. If you like what you're seeing, just wait till it's coming next. So the video of Tom Cruise you just saw is actually a deep fake version of Tom Cruise. And I'll give you another example. Here is a video right now on your screen showing you a location, but with two different seasons. I want you to look closely and see if you can spot anything. What you're actually seeing is one real season and another one that has been artificially generated I'll give you a second to guess which season is real and which one isn't. Well, if you said the snowy footage was the real one, you're wrong. The sunny season is actually the real one, while the snowy one was the one that was artificially generated. Okay, so here is another example from Adobe After Effects. Now, Adobe has a feature called the content aware feel tool, which allows anybody to be able to seamlessly remove objects from a video. This is something that you could have easily done prior on Photoshop and um, photographs generally, but now it's been you know, mainstreamed into video editing platforms. These innovations clearly have their benefits. For instance, in the case of the weather manipulation example that I shared, you can use that to train self-driving cars to adapt to different weather conditions in different cities. And in the case of the Adobe tool, you can actually use that as a cinematographer. I'm sure that's a blessing for those who are into filmmaking, to be able to take out unwanted objects in their video to make it more cinematic. However, imagine this. What if people started to use these tools to cause harm? What if perpetrators of crime started to use some of these tools to take out critical evidence of human rights atrocities that they have committed themselves? What if people start to create realistic deepfakes of political leaders calling for violence? What if real authentic videos of human rights abuses start getting dismissed just because 
you are not sure whether it has been manipulated or not. Unfortunately, some of these situations are not just mere speculations or imaginations. We currently, in the real world, are seeing how deepfake technology is being used to cause harm. There's research that's been carried out by this organization called Sensity AI. And one of the findings that they came up with is that the most common use of deepfake technology is for digital sexual violence. And about 90% of those that have been targeted have been women. So you see, there is a lot of harm that's already been caused as a result of these technologies. The question becomes, what can we do? I'll say that there are a number of things that we can do for sure. And starting with the innovators of technology themselves, they need to bear responsibility, knowing fully well that their innovations can be used to cause harm. And so innovators of technology need to prioritize issues of human rights, ask the question, how can my innovation possibly and potentially be used by bad actors to cause harm? Bring civil society to the table. Let us brainstorm together and figure out how to ensure that technology innovations do not lead to even further human rights abuses. Secondly, we are at that point where we all need to develop some sort of verification skill set. Let people start to you know, learn how to digitally verify pieces of media content to be sure what is authentic and what is not. Thirdly, from the perspective of witness as an organization is the fact that we will continue to train people to document human rights abuses, but to do that in the most ethical and trustworthy way to ensure that their videos that they may have taken a lot of risk to document are not dismissed as being fake. Finally, we all must take personal responsibility. We must understand that the things that we share, the apps that we use and the manner in which we use them and the technologies that we innovate can all contribute to our understanding and relationship with the truth. They can potentially begin to chip away at what we have come to know the truth to be. Okay, that's the end. And I'm going to bring us back to um, I just stop sharing my screen. Thank you all so much. I hope um, that was clear and um, everybody could hear and pick it. Um, it'd be good to have some feedback from the people in the room regarding what your thoughts are um, along the line. But at this point, um, I would love to introduce the panelists who are here, um, people that I admire so much, who have also done amazing work along these lines. Um, one of the some things that I didn't touch in my, in my video was the fact that amongst many other strategies for you know, addressing the challenge that we see with artificial intelligence and advancements in technology and how it impacts human rights is the fact that we should start thinking about regulations. Um, and who would be in charge of imposing those kinds of reg regulatory policies, whether it be soft law or, or hard law. And um, so to start off with, I would invite um, the chairperson of the African Commission, Dr. Solomon Durso, who himself has done some good work in this space. And the commission just this year did pass a resolution to undertake a study on how um, technology and artificial, artificial intelligence does impact um, human rights, especially in the context of, of Africa. So I would hand over to Dr. Solomon Durso to kindly share some of his thoughts on, on this idea. I am guessing that Dr. Durso isn't on the session yet. Oh yes, he's not yet here. So um, nevertheless, I think we could move on and um, would go on to Professor Emma Rotkamp. Um, I admire Professor Emma a lot. We've done some really good work together um, and it's a pleasure to have you on the panel, Prof. Um, I'll just give a quick background into your work. So Professor Emma Rotkamp Bloom is a professor and head of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Pretoria. She leads the ethics of AI research group at the Center for Artificial Intelligence Research in South Africa and is the co-chair of the steering committee for the Southern African Conference for AI Research. She is also a member of UNESCO's COMEST, which is Commission on the Ethics of Scientific and of the African Union Development Agency, AUDA. 
the NEPAD Consultative Roundtable on Ethics in Africa. She was the chairperson of the Bureau of the UNESCO Ad Hoc Expert Group tasked to prepare the recommendation for a global instrument on the ethics of AI in 2020 and to be approved at the UNESCO General Conference in 2021. She is the South African representative at the Responsible AI Network Africa. She is also a member of various advisory boards, such as that of the Swedish, Swedish Wallenberg AI Autonomous Systems and Software Program, um, the advisory board of the Global AI Ethics Institute, and country advisor for South Africa of the advisory board of the International Group of Artificial Intelligence. She is an associate editor of Science and Engineering Ethics, and her AI ethics research focuses on topics in machine and data ethics and on policy making. That is just a snippet of your wonderful um, work over the past years, um, but delighted to have you share, Prof. Um, so I'll hand over to you. You're muted, by the way. There we go. There we go. Sorry. The minute that you start sharing your screen, everything changes. Um, it's as if you're in a different universe. Um, thank you so much, Adebayo. It is always so nice to see you. Um, and thank you for the, to the organizers for inviting me. I will just um, try again to just get this thing to, in fact, do what I wanted to do. Um, okay, so I will, I know I only have 15 minutes, I will be as fast as possible. So in terms of AI ethics in Africa, I think there's much to be excited about. Um, and there are different organizations that in fact, um, are very much take um, AI um, ethics awareness and um, governance really um, seriously in the work that they do. One of these is definitely the deep learning in DARPA. Um, there's also in the Masakani um, Natural Language Processing Group um, that is specifically focused on research for African languages in the NLP domain. Um, there is, um, if one looks at their principles, there is um, very much serious awareness of AI ethics issues. Um, then um, Sisonki Biotech, um, the same. Um, this is a, um, a, a group focusing on um, research initiatives in Africa for machine learning and healthcare. The um, Data Science for Social Impact Research Group at UP under um, Vikosi Marivati um, does very good work in this regard. So does Data Science Africa. And then an example of this for me, still one of the best ones is the um, government funded digital ambassador program in Rwanda where young entrepreneurs provide, um, digi provide digital literacy training to members of their own communities in local languages and focusing on locally relevant um, digital content and technologies. Then there is the RAIN Africa project, which is the Responsible AI Network Africa, um, founded through a partnership between the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana and the Technical University of Munich in Germany. And the aim is to build a network of scholars working on the responsible design, development, deployment, and use of AI in Africa, and also to develop an AI ethics curriculum in Africa. Um, then um, just in terms of, of CARE, which is the Center for Artificial Intelligence Research, where I am the AI research, um, AI ethics research group leader. We have, um, we started in 2015, but actually only actively really in 2017, We've had quite a number of postgrad students graduate already. We have a um, AI for Society um, symposium series where researchers from across different disciplines have participated, which is exactly what we need because in fact, AI does not belong to the computer scientists only. Um, AI systems are socio-technical systems and belong to all um, disciplines. Um, and that is really important to understand and to acknowledge. And then we also launched the Southern African Conference for AI Research, which is now independent from CARE, but which started out um, by CARE hosting it, which has tracks for ethics of AI and AI for society. Um, then there's the African Union High Level Panel on Emerging Technologies, 
which was established in 2018 to advise the union, its various organs and member states on how Africa should harness emerging technologies for economic development. And of course, AI is one of these. There are some problems or dilemmas around this, however, um, I mean, the challenge is whether to go all out to become a global role player with the eye on economic gain for Africa versus taking time to stop and reflect on the potential social, moral and legal impact of AI technologies on vulnerable groups in our communities. And then also, of course, the African Union is an intergovernmental organization that can only adapt, adopt conventions and encourage adoption of laws in member states to give effect to them. Now, in terms of the concerns um, that, you know, we talk about AI ethics, what are we concerned about? So there are many, um, and they jeopardize the possibility for a harmonious life in the age of, of, um, in the age of AI. And I think we should, we should try, you know, that's, should be one of our aims, to embrace what the technology can bring while protecting anybody who could be harmed by it. So there are concerns around human control, imperiling the most vulnerable groups in society, the quality of human interaction and agency, amplification of inequality, threats to social justice and political stability, to the environment and ecosystems, and then concerns around the quality and integrity of information. There are specific harms that come from machine learning. Um, Kate Crawford identified two in 2017. Um, first is representational harm, which relates to confirming subordination of certain social groups, which is a cultural or social harm based on identity prejudice, and it's difficult to quantify, and is thus under the radar, and a resulting transactional allocation harm relating to allocation of economic goods and resources, also fume um, by um, structural bias, existing structural bias in societies. Unfortunately, the um, mechanics of machine learning is such that um, patterns are recognized and, and learned, um, which means that these kinds of concerns are then amplified. And this is why these are harms um, coming from machine learning specifically. There's also a new harm that has recently been highlighted by um, Timnit Gebru and some of her co-writers in a very um, uh, controversial article that has just appeared, which is the, the harm that uh, harming the integrity of human moral values in terms of value change or man manipulation inherent in some AI technologies. And um, some of these relate to, um, to fake information and disinformation, for, um, uh, I'm using the wrong term, sorry, Adebeo. Um, now there are certain threats that are specific to Africa. Um, deep fakes, as Adebayo um, discussed, and political instability. For instance, fake Twitter accounts to instigate distrust or strengthen hegemonic power. Ethics dumping. So, you know, um, the developed world, um, the North, um, just, you know, they just bring their, their, their technology this side because there, are, there is um, looser regulation. Um, cyber intelligence gathering, automated small arms gathering, exploitation of cheap labor, um, children are maybe not protected sufficiently, um, exploitation of ignorance in terms of data protection, widening inequality due to unmitigated job loss. Africans not owning the data are being collected in Africa. This is a huge concern as well as a serious threat. Um, and remaining excluded from global debates due to deepening inequality. There are some obstacles to hearing Africa's voice in AI ethics, however. Um, some of these are um, include ethnic and religious differences across the continent, um, differences among African states. In terms of AI ethics leadership and governance, concerns around implementation and compliance, capacity, regulating transnational companies, which again also pertains to owning our own data, unevenness of internet penetrability and cost of data, digital AI ethics, information and communication literacy linked to access to quality education and inequalities in, in education, energy issues here in South Africa, and we are now at level four of load shedding. So there will be six hours a day in which I will not have electricity. Um, exclusion from global AI ethics discourse in terms of testimonial injustice. There is a huge drive to include Africa in these kinds of discourses. 
Um, there is a lot of work done, for instance, where I can speak from, from the heart in terms of UNESCO, but I can also assure you that while there is also a lot of lip service, and I just want to highlight this, that it is not the case that people do not, um, that they want to falsify voices coming from Africa, or they don't want to, that, you know, they don't believe what people say um, from within Africa. It is, it is that people are not heard, full stop. It's not about engaging with content coming from Africa. It is that we are not part of these debates. And this is something that we should actively, actively work um, on. So there was a 2021 AI needs assessment survey done in Africa by UNESCO, and some needs were highlighted. Policy initiatives for AI governance need strengthening, legal and regulatory frameworks for AI governance need to be fostered, and the need for enhancing capacities for an implementation of AI governance is widely recognized. So here are some, not going to read this for you, but this, uh, these are some of the um, requests that came from African states to UNESCO, where they would need assistance in terms of AI governance and AI ethics, capacity building um, and governance. Um, so in terms of the recommendation on the ethics of AI, um, why it is interesting here is simply that it was the, it's the first global instrument on the ethics of AI. Um, the others are EU um, focused, or you know, nationally focused, um, or these are professional policies, but this is a global um, policy, and we will finally find out in within the next few weeks if this recommendation is going to be accepted by the general conference. Um, some important considerations. Just want to go quickly over a few of them and then come back to Africa. The most important feature of the document is that it is intended to be a recommendation for a global instrument. Um, other core cool focus points were gender equality and the protection of environment and the ecosystem. And there, of course, has to be full compliance with international law. There is a very fraught and interesting and complex relationship between ethics and the law. And we can have interesting conversations about that. But while we see ethics as a dynamic system informing um, legislation, of course, the recommendation is in full compliance with international law. Um, challenges to realize the promises of this instrument. Reality does not in all countries or wherever AI actors are gathered necessarily reflect the goals, values and principles mentioned in our draft documents. And there are political, economic, social, cultural and academic reasons for this. And then the exclusion of low and middle income countries from most international discussion on AI impacts on the development of and trust in AI technology and on the strength of adherence to regulation that these countries did not help formulate. So in terms of the UNESCO um, um, instrument, there were representation of four members out of each of the six regions of the world, but in general, this is not the case. Then of course, the minute that one starts talking about global views and one talks about ethics, one there is a tension between culture and a global AI ethics. So the notion of shared values versus the recognition of diversity and embracing of inclusivity and interconnectedness was a very tight balancing act for us. We realized that while some basic rules of interpretation are needed, acknowledging that thinking differently about certain values does not necessarily imply that the value itself changes. And this is core to building a global AI ethics. We need to be able to understand each other to mitigate the potential for a negative impact of AI technologies on humanity as a whole. But we don't need to think the same and speak the same to be able to understand each other. So at the same time, we insisted that the meaning ascribed to values is articulated and communicated in a context of openness to diverse engagement and epistemic justice such that the meaning of every word, voice that participates can be heard. We need to be sensitive to formulation and recognize culture as a calculus of values and inter an interpretation tool to measure inclusivity and predict adherence. You cannot just push things top down onto people. Um, so for instance, a very interesting debate in the domain of AI ethics in these terms, for instance, is the the fact that the fallback to individual rights vocabulary is natural to the West, 
But in African communitarian communities, the notion of individual rights is in fact related to duties in complex ways. So this asks for sensitivity in formulation. Um, and then there was some basic general foci that we had, the urgency, the participati participation of all cultures, um, focused on developing an AI ethics readiness tool, viewing readiness as a, as a dynamic status, helping all countries or member states to, to try and measure where they are at and what they would need. Um, but what I want to focus on now, I mean, the last two, I think, or three slides, is the way forward for an African AI ethics. I think it is necessary that we view AI ethics in, this, in these terms as a dynamic system. And this is also what we did at UNESCO, recognizing that ethical values and principles can help develop and implement right-based policy measures and legal norms by providing guidance with a view to the fast pace of technological development. The technology is such that it moves very fast. And you know, with all due respect here, I say it at the, at the Center for Human Rights, but the law is sometimes slower. So we need a dynamic system of ethics that can interact and has kind of its ear on the ground and um, also inform um, uh, the law. And here, you know, please I'd say I am very much in respect of, of, of international law, but I think there is a need to recognize the role of ethics also in terms of all emerging technologies. So the second thing that I want to highlight is trust in technology. The focus should be on use of technology for the benefit of Africans so that legislation and policies are risk-based in African contexts while being owned by all AI actors in responsible manners. The way in which regulations are formulated should take cultural and religious values into consideration in continuous open discourse with all stakeholders. Um, and then suggestions for an AI ethics for Africa. Regulations should be formulated with the, no, uh, with the knowledge of the specific impact in a specific country or region or segment of society in mind and be continuously revised and evaluated. Um, re regulations should actively facilitate change for the better in communities in which data-driven practices are applied, which means that data must be representative of the needs and interests of those it is intended to support. In terms of um, data activists and research data activist practices, I mean, we go as far as to say that, um, you know, we should only, a data collection should only be allowed if there can be engagement with um, social causes. Um, so, and this is really important, I think, um, that we, we get it right. Um, we get that right in Africa. Regulation should be bottom up and contextual, encouraging citizen engagement not top down and abstract. Data should be viewed as a point of intervention for engagement with social causes, as opposed to subscribing to massive data collection with perhaps some economic value for governance, governments, but with little or no accountability to African communities providing the data. So Africa, if we now look at um, the future, Africa will become more and more important in these um, conversations on AI ethics, because of our youth um, and maybe the African ethical collectivist paradigm may very well turn out to be the golden thread needed to weave together a sustainable global AI narrative focused as it is on harmony, shared human values and the interconnectedness of all humans. If furthermore, we can find a workable AI ethics governance approach in Africa, it will be of immeasurable value as example to the rest of the world given the ethnic and religious diversity across Africa. And then it is also necessary sometimes to remind ourselves, trying to end on a positive note, that responsible and beneficial universal access to AI and other emerging technologies is an opportunity, not a burden. Core problems in Africa, such as sustainability, equality, climate change, access to healthcare and education, food security, can be mitigated by beneficial and responsible engagement with AI technologies, despite the very serious concerns that we have. But so the way forward toward, toward an AI ethics for Africa is ultimately, I think, by protecting the integrity of human values 
and the interconnectedness of all humans and of humans and the environment. And this can only be affected by bottom-up regulation generated by the communities being impacted on the, about, on the one hand and by the tech community on the other. They also have a responsibility in an organic, immediate and uncalculated bond of solidarity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Emma Rodkan Bloom. It was really good hearing your thoughts on this. Um, I know that if we had more time, you could have gone on and on, but uh, um, thank, you for, thank you for compressing so much in just such a short time as well. I would want the um, participants to also ask questions. So I would encourage people, if you have questions, kindly put them in the chat and we'll come back to them. Before I go to Dr. Solomon Durso, I see that he's, he's joined us now. Uh, Prof, I would want to ask you a question. You, you raised a number of um, issues which have been of huge concern to us at Witness as well. Um, I like how you hit the nail on the head when you said there's a lot of lip service to including Africans in the conversation that we are not necessarily, it's not like, um, we're basically not just heard, you know, and um, that is the reality. But then the pushback that has been given in some quarters is that why don't Africans then go ahead and, you know, take the steps to to have these conversations and begin to formulate policies instead of waiting to be incorporated into the conversations in the West. Um, because at the end of the day, you also make a good argument about how no matter what the policies are from the West, they would not necessarily be totally fitted for the African situation. So what are we waiting for? I mean, why don't we just go ahead? We, we, we did the same thing with the CEDAW, we made the Maputo Protocol. We did the same thing with many of these other the international treaties and then we domesticated our own version because they just were missing key issues that were peculiar to Africa. So I'm throwing that question to you. I know it's complicated, but just be good to know why should Africa wait to be incorporated into the conversations from the West and why don't we just take, take over and move ahead and create our own policies? Well, I don't think we should wait and I don't think we are waiting, in fact. It is simply that the international community is not aware of that. And in certain cases, given the transnational issues that we are facing with these kinds of technologies and the big tech companies who come and dump um, their work on our doorsteps, um, we need to be heard on a, global, um, on a global stage. But we are not waiting, Adebo, I can promise you that. If I just look at what we do in RAIN Africa, if I look, I mean, I can tell you, I mean, I started off with just a few, but there are a lot, there is a lot of work being done. Um, and, you know, in, in, in very, very small countries, um, you know, sometimes I'm really, I, we, here I am in South Africa, and we compared to some other African countries, we do not even closely enough. We don't have enough legislation. Um, so what we, at the moment we have Papaya where we don't have anything else um, specifically pertaining to our ethics regulation. Um, and that is that should be a wake up call for us. But in Africa in general, um, there, people are definitely aware and the youth is aware, of course not across the board for reasons that we all understand in Africa, but we are not asleep and we definitely, we're not waiting for the waste. And we should- Absolutely. Yeah, and you're right that we're not asleep. And I will come to Dr. Durso, who definitely represents that section of uh, uh, people, uh, the African Union, the African Commission specifically, that are not waiting, but taking steps by initiating soft law. Um, but yes, you also mentioned a very valid point in terms of big tech has a lot of influence. So most of the big tech are owned by the West. And so whatever policies are also being engineered are being engineered there and they would impact on Africa at the end of the day. So we at the, at the, at the end of the day, we have to be at the table together, even as we also craft solutions specific to Africa. So but we'll come back to you with some other questions um, at, after everybody has spoken. I will move to Dr. Solomon Durso, speaking about Africa and Africans not waiting, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights did pass a resolution um, at the extraordinary session earlier this year that touches on the need for African states to embark on um, studies and policies that would address the issue of how AI and um, technology affect and impact human rights. Uh, Dr. Simon Derso, it's good to have you here. Dr. Simon Derso is the chairperson of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. So I would ask you, sir, to take the floor and kindly share in the next couple of minutes.
Thank you very much, uh, Dario. Uh, I wish to once again thank uh, the Center for Human Rights and all uh, the colleagues and friends who have contributed to the organization of this event. Um, and it is uh, a pleasure for me to join you once again uh, in this great uh, Tech for Rights Expo. Um, and I wish to congratulate all of you for that. Um, as the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, um, we have a clear mandate in terms of uh, tracking the various economic, social, and political developments on the African continent, uh, and indeed such other developments that may happen uh, globally uh, that could have a bearing on the enjoyment and promotion and protection of human and people's rights on the African continent. And on the basis of such tracking to initiate um, relevant uh, actions, which may take the form as provided for in the African Charter of Human and People's Rights, particularly Article 45, of undertaking studies uh, in order to um, address emerging human and people's rights issues uh, of continental significance uh, to also develop guidelines and lay down principles uh, in order to um, address uh, such uh, human and people's rights uh, issues. The development of new technologies uh, have transformed uh, the lives of people across the world. Uh, understandably, um, not all people would be affected, whether positively or negatively, equally uh, by the development and use of new technologies. Some would be uh, affected uh, differently from others. And this arises from uh, a number of factors, one of which has to do with the fact that the development uh, of some of these technologies is predominantly happening in certain in certain parts of the world. Um, I've highlighted earlier on, uh, big tech companies uh, are mostly uh, housed in uh, developed uh, countries, um, having and operating in a particular setting and therefore the development of those technologies is informed by the particular environment in which those um, entities are developing technologies uh, and that would obviously have uh, a lot of consequences in terms of its impact as far as minorities are concerned as far as people outside of those regions are concerned the other um, aspect uh, of you know, the development of new technologies and their use uh, is, of course, um, the question of the sync between the governance framework of new technologies and uh, the use and deployment of new technologies. Uh, I think all indications are that um, the governance system, whether within the human rights realm or uh, broadly speaking, uh, is doing uh, a lot of catching up with the pace of development and deployment of new technologies. Uh, and in that catching up process, uh, there is a vacuum. Uh, the, uh, in which uh, these technologies are being deployed. So for us, at the African Commission on Human and, and, and People's Rights, I think uh, as the impact, I think that, that, that is one of the considerations, as we experience the transformative impact of new technologies, um, a number of questions arise. And some of the questions relate to uh, the question of how do we go about ensuring that new technologies would add 
enhance and support the enjoyment of human and people's rights. That they serve the purpose of protecting and fulfilling the human needs for freedom, dignity, equality. I think it is really the, 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 these kinds of questions that we are looking at. I mean, the, these are extremely uh, important questions. Um, thanks to technology that we are able from wherever we are to communicate and interact in the way that we are doing today. And this is a very, very good thing. And it's not simply that that this is a good thing for those of us who have access to these kinds of technologies, for example. And the question of access is the other dimension that we need to really think through um, uh, in, in a time like this. In the course of the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic, it has become clear that one of the ways for mitigating the disastrous consequences of COVID-19 is the deployment of uh, new technologies, right? Uh, such as, for example, for continuing with uh, work, continuing with uh, schooling for students. But if we forget to take account of the fact that only a fraction of the population on the continent and in other parts of the world, uh, one can imagine, do have literacy, do have access to these technologies, and therefore would be in a position to benefit from these technologies. And, 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 and that's why the question of access becomes important. Of course, as we talk about access, I think it's extremely important also to understand the literacy dimension of it. And it's important to understand also uh, what access means uh, from the positional perspective of people positioned or situated in different positions and what access means for differently positioned or situa situated uh, people. So that is the other dimension. And then we also look at, if you look at the resolution, which is resolution um, 473 of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights on the need to undertake a study uh, on new technologies, including artificial intelligence, robotics, and, and, and uh, other new and emerging technologies, uh, you clearly see uh, the kinds of issues of concern that, um, the African Commission had highlighted in, uh, in this resolution, um, which has been developed together with and on the basis of consultations with various uh, organizations, uh, some of which are part of this uh, deliberation that we are having uh, today. And, and from this uh, resolution, you clearly see that one other area where we need to work on has to do with the adverse consequences or impact of uh, these technologies uh, and the kind of measures that need to be uh, instituted in order to limit and, if possible, uh, completely uh, remove these adverse consequences uh, so that these new technologies wouldn't be the vehicle for causing more damage in terms of uh, resulting in violation of human and people's rights, for causing more damage in terms of relationships within communities, within nations, and between nations, for causing damage to the well being of individuals, uh, particularly the most vulnerable, such as, for example, children. And ultimately, of course, um, issues relating to autonomous systems and, and, and human control over certain uh, technologies, 
the importance that this has uh, for purpose of uh, responsibility, for purpose of also um, accountability is extremely, extremely important. So we look at that dimension of things. Now, given the position that Africa occupies in the world, the other dimension of the issue that we look at is what kind of policy approach um, beyond and above, for example, the, the work that the African Commission does, what kind of policy approach broadly at a continental level need to be put in place in terms of um, active participation of Africa, both in terms of the development of new technologies, but importantly, in terms of the uh, deployment and use of new technologies. What are the principles from a human rights perspective? What are the guidelines from human rights perspective are indicated from the perspective of African ethics as well? What are the principles and guidelines that need to be, that need to guide the deployment and use of new technologies on the African continent? And how do we inform these principles and guidelines drawing on rich normative frameworks that we have on the African continent that are meant to advance the interests and rights of various categories of people um, who are affected differently from the deployment and use of uh, new technologies. I think we have come to recognize also the importance of these questions about uh, the kind of policies that we need to have from the fact that the effective regulation of these technologies in order for them to support and advance the development of human beings and, and, and communities, that we need to rely on a wide range of expertise and a wide range of instruments those instruments that go beyond and above the state-centric um, approach that we usually deploy in terms of the protection and promotion of human rights. So what that means is basically we need to have uh, norms that, that shape and inform international relations of African states and the African continent and its role in global governance becomes so particularly important. And in that respect, obviously, it's not just policies, but also what kind of platform do we need to have? We can have you know, regulations, we can have policies, but I think we need to also have platforms on a continuous basis that enable to track, to debate, and indeed propose solutions on a continuous basis platforms within Africa, but also platforms that enable Africa to speak with others who are in a position for the development and deployment of these new technologies. And of course, I think the role and responsibility of individuals, communities, um, nations, uh, individual nations, and collectively, I think needs also to be probed, um, probed very seriously in order to ensure that different stakeholders take different responsibilities for purpose of um, ensuring that we harness the positive contributions of new technologies while work very, very hard, really hard. I think that is one of the things that we have come to witness, uh, not only during COVID, but also broadly speaking, with the kind of um, very disastrous uh, consequences that uh, algorithms that are used in various platforms are having um, in terms of uh, peace, stability, and indeed in terms of the effective uh, exercise of self-determination and democratic governance, um, particularly um, in parts of the world like ours. Um, those are, I think, some of the points that I wish to uh, highlight uh, in terms of uh, where we are heading at the African Commission. Uh, we have set ourselves for developing a study on 
this, uh, a study that would help us to have a specific understanding of the ways in which new technologies are um, being developed, being deployed on the African continent. The ways in which the development and deployment of new technologies is affecting uh, the continent and how it affects different people situated differently and the implication of this for the effective implementation of the African Charter and other human rights instruments. And what needs to happen in order to position the continent and different people uh, for ensuring that we get the best out of new technologies while also limit um, its adverse and negative consequences. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Durso. Really appreciate your intervention. Um, and there's a question for you in the chat, but I would I would have us say that till when we when we have taken all the speakers, um, because then it's also relating to the resolution of the commission. I also have some questions I genuinely want to ask, but I think I should just move on because I'm looking at our time and we still have uh, amazing contributions for from two more speakers but I will come back to those questions um, right after that we've heard from Karen from Favor, but thank you so much, Dr. Um, I will move on quickly to our next speaker, Karen, who, whose resting face is a smiling face. I'm sure all of you would agree with me. If you look at your screen, she has a resting face that is a smiling face, which is so beautiful to just look at. But yes, um, Karen is the global Program Director at the Center for AI and Digital Policy, which aims to ensure that artificial intelligence and digital policies promote a better society, more fair, more just, and more accountable, a world where technology promotes broad social inclusion based on fundamental rights, democratic institutions, and the rule of law. She currently runs the KAIDP AI Policy Clinic together with Mayor Rottenberg and Merv Hickok. As an expert in EU law, she is the editor-in-chief of the European Law Journal and senior lawyer course director at the course director at the Academy of European Law. She holds a PhD in law from the European University Institute, was a Jean Monnet research fellow within the Center for International and Regional Economic Law and Justice at NYU and visiting scholar at Columbia Law School. She has taught at Sciences Po Paris, Université Paris X. Université Lyon, um, the third France, European Inter-University Center for Human Rights and Democratization in Venice, Italy, the, Center European, the Central European University of Budapest, Hungary, and many others. Um, I could go on and on. Um, bienvenue, Karin. Yes, thank you. So you've already acknowledged that I'm actually French. <laughs> so <laughs> I apologize in advance for my French accent, very strong. And uh, indeed, I'm the Global Program Director from the Center for AI and Digital Policy, CIDP. Thank you for um, pinpointing the aim of this center because this is the point of view, the perspective from which I will be speaking this morning. So we heavily focus, my work has always been focused on fundamental rights and in this case, AI. So first of all, I would like to thank the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria, and more particularly, Franz Villon and Lengi Vedouve for the invitation this morning. So I already clarified my standpoint as the Pro Global Program Director for the CADP. And today, I have been tasked with addressing existing global trends in AI policy and human rights, giving examples from different continents other than Africa, and this in 15 minutes. So this is pretty much a daunting task. So what I will try to do is to briefly sketch policy trends in regulating AI from a human-centered perspective. In so doing, I will try to shed light on key factors influencing the way AI governance is currently being developed, such as geopolitical and cultural considerations. Due to the limited amount of time available, I will focus my analysis on uh, three key players in the field, the EU, the US, and China. 
And I must say that what CIDP, my organization, has been doing, we did a report on AI and democratic values. It's a study on the policies of 30 countries in the world. We have a 2020 edition and we're going to have a 2021 edition about 50 countries, policy, policies in 50 countries in the world. So please, if you want more details about other countries' policy, you can check out our report. It's for free. It's freely available online. Thank you for this. So um, I have, as, as also uh, Adebayo has mentioned, I am French and I'm also a new citizen. So I hope I won't be too biased, but OK. Then I have displayed my personal bias. So uh, the prevailing assumption since the creation of the World Wide Web has been that it was a space of freedom. The concretization somehow of um, utopian land of milk and honey, where people could express themselves and their creativity. This is actually a narrative that some big techs have continued to vehiculate in order to avoid state regulation, framed as an encroachment upon individual rights and freedom. However, already in 2014, Tim Berners-Lee, who is the inventor of the web, declared, Quotation, on the 25th birthday of the web, I ask you to join in, to help us imagine and build the future standards for the web, and to press for every country to develop a digital bill of rights to advance a free and open web for everyone. Fast forwarding to today, where do we stand? And more particularly, as far as AI is concerned. So first, um, I guess we should ask, what is AI? And interestingly enough, it is hardly defined in legislation. If we take the example of the proposed EU AI Act, it is not defined in it. And if we take the example also of the even more recent Chinese new generation of AI86 code, it is not defined in there either in this code. So why it is and should it be defined? Some say yes for reasons of legal certainty, but more often than not, these narratives are developed by big techs in an attempt to minimize the scope of any potential regulation. Because then it might be the case that you don't catch some instances where AI does intervene or will intervene in the future due to technological developments. Some of the people say, no, uh, we shouldn't de really define AI and simply refer to AI simply because indeed the, legis the legislative pace is much slower than technological advances. So the only way to catch up and protect human rights is to refer to AI and define it in specific cases. So for example, case law, case law. However, if you take again the example of the proposed EU AI Act, what you will see is that there's no definition proper of AI, what it is exactly, but there are annexes to the EU AI Act in which some um, specific AI techniques are listed and some will be banned, some other will be submitted to strong obligations and so on and so forth. And these annex are easily, um, it is easily possible to amend these annexes. So this is the added value. It takes a lot of time to, uh, to adopt the legislation However, to amend annexes, it's much easier and faster. So that's another solution. But for our purpose today, suffice is to say that one of the big risks for human rights comes from the way machines are trained to learn from large amounts of data. So there are two main issues. The first one concerns the data used to train machines. How accurate is the set of data used and how machines are trained with them this can lead to perpetrating past prejudice and enable present day discriminations. This points to the need for auditing for having auditing systems, for algorithmic transparency, for example, or for respect for privacy. And for example, in the EU, we do have the right to uh, data, to personal data and data protection. China also adopted a, um, equivalent uh, legislation recently. So the second issues concern AI being deliberately abused. So some of autocracies can use AI as a tool of state-sponsored oppression, division, and discrimination, such, such as mass surveillance and social scoring. 
but risks do not come only from autocratic states. There are issues in democratic states also regarding, for example, national security or police activities inside and outside the countries or regarding third country nationals such as migrants and refugees. So as far as potential human rights violations are concerned, there are two sides of the AI cons. Potential violations by tech, by big techs or corporations using AI, potential violations by states using AI technologies. So what are the policy trends we have been witnessing based on policy analysis of these three key players, the US, the EU, and China? I will here make the links between the policy and regularity choice choices and geopolitical consideration. As far as the EU is concerned, the European Union, building on the economic weight of its internal market and considering that most big techs are not in the EU, this is also an important factor, uh, the EU strategy has been to use legislative tools in order to set its own standards and set standards globally. And I must say it has been pretty much a winning strategy. So if we take the example of the general data protection regulation, the GDPR, what did the EU did do? It first, uh, it, the GDPR enshrined rights, several rights regarding data protection to protect citizens against potentially harmful big tech activities. And quite interestingly, this regulation has an extraterritorial scope, which means that as soon as there is an EU element in the situation concerned, the GDPR applies. As also interesting is that internationally speaking, the development of this EU legislation has been coupled with a revision of Convention 108. And what is Convention 108? It's an international treaty which has been drafted by the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe um, are, uh, concerns the entire European continent. It's not just the EU with its 20, 27 member states, it's the entire continent. So the provision of the new Convention 108 and the GDPR are pretty much close, which means that it, exp it expands the scope of influence of the GDPR, even more so considering that actually non-European states can become members can ratify the, the Convention 108 plus, since it's a revised version. So, and the last time, last thing, there's another interesting feature, which is um, the mechanism of adequacy decision. What does that mean? It means that basically it allows the EU to check whether foreign standards are equivalent to EU standards. And if they are, the EU will allow the transfer of data from of EU citizens to foreign countries. If it doesn't, uh, if there's no equivalence, there won't be transfers. And very famously, the Court of Justice of the European Union has tracked and trust, uh, the, the EU, EU and US data transfer agreements. Two times it said, no, it, it in, in the Court of Justice invalidated these agreements. So this is to say that it is quite a powerful weapon, so to say. So basically, what the, what the EU has been trying to do in order to set standards for itself and globally with the GDPR, it is now doing with the proposed EU AI Act. And this has, and actually, this is why I said that it is a pretty much a winning strategy, is that the GDPR has led other countries to adopt their own legislation in the field. It has proved that adopting a legislation is not a competitive disadvantage, but on the contrary, a tool to set global standards and protect your own rights, values, and interests. So now we will see how winning this strategy has been. And one of the main uh, way you can see if it's, um, it's, it's an efficient strategy is whether it is adopted by others. And we will now turn to China. And precisely this year, China has adopted a personal information protection law, which is the equivalent of the GDPR, which focus main, mainly on freedom for citizens, but mostly on control by China over big techs. And in September this year, 
the China, China has adopted a new generation of AI ethics code. So what is it here, the geopolitical objective of China? It is very clear and China is transparent about it. They want to become the leader in the field of AI by 2030. And it is very interesting to have a look at this new generation for, of AI ethics code. Just to read the first article. These specifications aim to integrate ethics and morals into the full cycle of artificial intelligence, promote fairness, justice, harmony, and safety, and avoid issues such as prejudice, discrimination, privacy, and information leakage. So here you see there's a, you wouldn't find in an EU regulation, for example, anything regarding harmony. You have a heavy cultural undertones in it, but there is a specificity which is worth noting. Uh, given the Chinese government's nationwide biometric surveillance network and its digital identity social credit system, a blacklist that continuously scores citizens for their trustworthiness, the guidelines likely only apply to non-government system use and not to government systems. So what is interesting here is the beginning of the sentence. The specifications aim to integrate ethics, but also morals. And here it leads us to moral governance. So social governance in China does not just encompass material and environmental features, but also the behaviors of citizens. It has been argued that opening up to the external world has created a moral vacuum or moral decline in China. So this is something that has been recognized by the Chinese government with high level officials, including, including President Xi, and they developed the idea of a minimum moral standard within society. And moral governance extends to regulating the behavior of citizens and enhancing their moral integrity, which is considered a task within the government's remit. The intention to rely on AI for moral governance can be seen in further legislation, with perhaps the clearest example being the state's consign outlined for the establishment of a social credit system released in 2014. The documents underscored that the social credit system did not just aim to regulate financial and corporate actions of business and citizens, but also the social behavior of individuals. We could find further concrete examples in China using AI in social governance, for example, regarding the, Yugo, the, the Uyghur population. And there are many more examples of use of facial, um, facial recognition technologies and biometric technologies as well. But what is very interesting in any case is that China has been using this AI regulation, this AI code, in order to crack down and control its population and big technologies. And here you can ask, you could say, yes, but it's just a code of ethics and not a law. But here you have to consider the cultural meaning of law in a country. And for China to have a code of ethics might be as powerful and as efficient as a law because the state, there's no real difference, there's no big difference between the state per se and the population. It is again a question of harmony. And if we go now, because we have to go quickly to the US, we see that the, U, the geopolitical goal of the US has been to keep its position as a leader in this field. It has, for example, faced with the rise of China and it's, it has been searching for a law to keep its position and has been trying to find allies with other democracy. So recently we had the EU-US Trade Council and it is very interesting to see the emphasis on cooperation in the field of AI and democratic values and ban on social scoring, which is precisely used by SANA. In terms of policy and regulatory approach, yes, the EU enacted the Privacy Act in 1974, but since then it has been very difficult to advance in the, um, through legislation. So what they've been doing, actually a new suggestion has been to elaborate a US Bill of Rights for an AI powered world. This has been uh, an idea by Eric Lander and Alain Nelson, who both work for the Science 
and Society for uh, Science and Society at the White House Office and Science and Technology. And we will see if indeed the path to a Bill of Rights will allow them to mitigate the consequences on fundamental rights by AI technologies. And I would like to say a final word about Africa. I know I was not supposed to say so, but let's say, as I said, the basis of AI is data, personal data. This is really the biggest resources that Africa and African have, African countries. You, have, you are most, one of the most populated continents and you have a very young population. If you are managed to have legislation or something that fits with your own culture um, regarding control and access to data, you can also do so regarding AI and you can control your own future. At least that's what the EU is trying to do. Now, I wish you good luck as well. Thank you. We need all those best wishes for sure. Um, somebody once said that the next, um, I hope it doesn't happen, that the next uh, world war will be a, a war of data. So I, I hope we don't get into uh, another world war. It, it never ends well. So, but thank you so much, Karen. Um, really appreciate it. I totally would love to come back to you with questions, but because we're really out of time and I crave your indulgence, everyone, that you kindly gave us a few more minutes um, so that we could quickly hear from our last speaker, who I'll just introduce right now. Her name is Favor Borokini. And Favor is a Nigerian data and digital rights researcher working with policy, a Ugandan civic technology organization. And in her role, she arches a number of naughty topics related to technology facilitating violence against women and the general impact of subsisting and emerging technologies on social justice and equality. She also works as a content writer with Ethical Intelligence, an AI ethics consulting firm, and with various research groups on topics related to data protection regulation, healthcare delivery, and is currently an affiliate with the Future Society. I've had some beautiful conversations with, with Favor in the past, um, and I really look forward to what she has to share with us today. So Favor, quickly, I would really now ask that you kind of keep it to about um, less than 10 minutes if you can. Um, Thank okay. You. Thank you so much, Bio. Um, it's great to be here. I would like to share my screen, if that's all right. Okay. Um, Absolutely. Yes. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, yes. I can see my screen, so I believe everyone can see it as well. Yes, we can. Um, Yes. So um, it, the previous speakers have um, spoken, I've actually said a lot about um, some of the topics that I intend to address. So I think that would also um, assist in the in cutting down the time as well. Okay, I am trying to locate something on my laptop. Where is it? Ah, okay, there it is. Or not. Okay. Okay, um, let me move forward with the presentation, which I cannot even find anymore. Everything just goes all right when you begin to share your screen for some reason. Okay, there it is. And for the second part, yes. Okay. So uh, my presentation focuses on AI and women's rights in Africa. And ah, yes, so um, I'd like to begin with a slide talking about the African context and the importance of AI to Africa. I think whenever we have discussions about artificial intelligence in Africa, we focus a lot on the positives um, and AI has been can you see my screen, what I'm sharing? Yes, we can. Okay, <laughs> yes. So um, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of ways AI has, has been um, promised to support our economic growth, healthcare, um, agriculture, public service delivery, and financial services. Essentially, um, AI has been said to be one of the essential emerging technologies that will contribute to um, what is being described as the fourth industrial revolution. 
in Africa. And here this slide um, shows some examples of um, current applications of AI in Africa. Our policy, we recently released a report that, uh, and this table is just um, an excerpt of some of the current applications. So we see Mauritius, Ethiopia, Uganda, Egypt, Rwanda. Um, we see applications related to chatbots, machine learning, um, automated referrals, drug ordering, um, natural language processing, adaptive learning, and, and so on. Uh, so when we talk about artificial intelligence and women's rights in Africa, though, I like to think of the situation, especially in terms of um, technology facilitated violence, to be a continuum. And um, uh, okay, going to my first point about digital rights being women's rights, it, it's sort of a play on the um, on, on what we like to say when we advocate for gender equality that women's rights are. Um, human rights and digital rights are also women's rights because women are human. So we could define digital rights to mean human rights that are expressed in digital spaces or environments. So I, I, I do not like to limit the definition of um, digital rights to simply um, online spaces because there are many ways we relate with technology, both analog and digital that are not necessarily online. For instance, when you talk about your smartwatch or your your smart fridge, or maybe even your um, electric prepaid meter, for instance. So um, this would imply this implies the direct application of the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights in order to upload, uphold the dignity and equality of people everywhere, including online spaces. So. Um, so then moving on to the second point about gendered harms caused by AI. Uh, in an article titled, Is it actually violence? Framing technology facilitated abuse as violence by Susie Dunn. She says, at the present time, technology facilitated violence is a relatively new phenomenon that is not well understood by general society. It faces the same challenges of tolerance and minimization that sexual harassment faced and continues to face. So um, what this really means is that there is a sort of minimization that applies to the sort of abuse that women face in, um, in technology facilitated or technology enabled spaces and technology technological devices. And as our previous, as the previous speaker, Karen, mentioned, AI-powered products and services today are primarily powered through data sets. And through these data sets and through the processes involved in training algorithms with them, certain bias, biases are able to creep into these algorithms. So um, data, which is basically historical information about anything, is often reflective of certain biases. It could be biases in hiring, biases in, um, in housing, in education, in, um, in, in just about anything, in just about ev any, every single way human beings relate with each other. There are certain biases that we fall back on whenever we make these decisions, the decisions that we make. And this um, machine learning algorithms trained using racist or sexist data, for instance, are capable of replicating these patterns. And we already have um, infamous examples being um, Amazon's hiring algorithm and then the Compass recidivism algorithm that, um, that basically made it in such a way with judges, re, judges in the United States relying on the algorithm to sentence black men in the US to jail time, even for less egregious crimes than um, their white counterparts. So if an organization has historically banned women from entry into its ranks, or a school has historically banned women, or women of a certain ethnicity from studying, or studying certain costs. Uh, these algorithms are driven to follow these patterns of employment or admission or housing. And so essentially, algorithms are unable to change their minds or to learn 
but work as mirrors reflecting current and past decisions. So we have this um, very beautiful picture here about how um, in the AI uprising, the robot uprising, the machine lost because relying on historical data, the majority of battles have been won using pre-modern weaponry. So because um, AI or machine learning systems are unable to learn, unable to change their minds as human beings can, they essentially rely on this data uh, to a fault. So they constantly have to re, um, replicate past decisions. So um, I know Bio was talking about a World War Three of data, but maybe it would not be such a bad thing. I, I mean, it would definitely be a bad thing, but I think about the fact that um, AI is definitely not as it's not able to, it's not as smart or able to take decisions on its own. It's not able to review or um, learn new things other than what its handlers decide, other than what the data it is trained with um, essentially comprises of. And then um, on the other hand, the development and deployment of new AI products and services serve to encode and engender pre-existing stereotypes about women. So AI could be said to impact women rights through two major means, by perpetuation and by propagation. So um, it could of, of course be a blend of the two, a certain already existing type of sexual or sex violence um, could be given a new form of expression due to AI, such as typical pornography, as Bio mentioned in this presentation earlier. So um, it could be new forms that are being created. It could be an existing one that is being facilitated, or it could be a new version of an existing sort of violence. So um, now we come to causes and effects. Let me go to the next slide. And here's where I'd like to focus on the continuum of tech facilitated violence. So um, we could start at any point in the circle, actually, but let's start from privacy and safety harms. And a very good example of, um, of this would be deep fix, for instance. And when we talk about a continuum, um, gender research, research, researchers into um, violence against women have defined um, violence against women to be to exist on the continuum that is they exist in such a way that no aspect of it can be taken independently of the other so ai facilitated harms cut across the social emotional financial and other facets of women's lives and operates on an interconnected continuum so if we begin from privacy and safety harms, such as those caused by deep fakes and deep fake pornography, and we, we regard the impact of um, sexual shaming on women, which um, harms, which has the capacity to cause women to lose their livelihoods, um, depression, and even cause um, loss of lives due to due to the depression, of course. And then we then move to the encoded bias in, in the system. And then we could then move to how the encoded biases in the system results in the exclusion of women from the development process of AI. So we have to think about how, for instance, um, biases in the AI development pipeline mean that there are much fewer um, women working in development. There are much fewer AI engineers or developers who are women. There is also the proliferation of female voice assistants to think of. There's the fact that, uh, for instance, in Nigeria, um, just last week, an insurance, a, a very popular insurance company recently launched their, um, their chatbots and the name is Nikki. And I, I thought it was so odd. I, and I immediately Googled um, chatbots in Nigeria. And I saw that I think out of about nine banks in Nigeria, six have chatbots or other sorts of um, 
virtual voice assistants and they were all given female personas. And it, it's sort of reflective of the societal bias that women are meant to occupy subservient roles or women are meant to be assistants to, um, to powerful men or, or, or that women cannot actually lead and that they, they are facilitators or administrators. And there's also um, the language when we talk about um, AI um, translations, for instance, if you, you might take a random piece of text in whatever language you refer, or especially languages that have that do not that have a gender neutral pronouns. Yoruba is a very good example, and I speak Yoruba. So, and you could paste it into Google for the automated translation process take place. And you would find that certain pronouns have been translated into he, and certain pronouns have been translated into she. And you find a correspondence between, um, let's say, professional occupations such as doctors or lawyers or engineers would then take on the he pronoun, while nurses or teachers or some other administrative professions would then take on the she pronoun. That's why the fact that there is literally no word for he or she in the Yoruba language. And this definitely says to encode bias in the system. And then there's the issue of intersecting identities. The fact that as African women, we, um, we, have, we could face oppression along the axis of sex and also along the axis of race. And then there are data deficits, which imply that there is just not enough gender or sex um, disaggregated data concerning African women. And then there's also the underlying um, social and economic exclusion, which already exists. Loans, when it comes to loans and jobs and housing and travel, these are all um, areas which women do not, which women are not represented in quite as heavily as men. And um, the fintech space in Nigeria, for instance, is booming very, very much. So we have and um, we have a situation where it has caused a sort of predatory environment to, to evolve. And you could install an app on your phone and it, it's probably a loan app and it will request all sorts of information about you. And it could go through your browser history, for instance, and determine if you are credit worthy client. Now, if we think about the fact that women are less likely to connect to the internet, are less likely to own phones, and when they own phones, are less likely to own um, smartphones and often only have access to feature phones, then we see that um, these apps or these organizations might simply decide that since there is no data about this person's browsing um, interest, there is no way for us to categorize or determine um, what if this person is um, credit worthy, then we could just decide to not give you the loan because we don't really know much about you. So these are all examples of how bias is encoded in the system and which results in the exclusion of women from development um, process, which is caused as well through, um, well, the fact that very few women and girls are encouraged to go into STEM courses and the fact that the uh, the ones who do are often booted out due to the hostile environment. The exclusion of women from the development process could then also result in the encoding of bias into the system due to the fact that there's just no representation of women in the system. And then we could go on to how AI is not being designed with the needs of African women in mind because there are no African women in the development pipeline and how this also results in the exclusion of women from the development process. And with the fact that there are not just um, the um, applications that have been developed and not been developed with um, the needs of African women in mind, then no one who is then making certain that privacy and safety guidelines have been made available in all these products that have been developed who is who, who, where are the um, the safety locks where are the um, the the um, the content moderation guidelines who is to say who, who is working to ensure that it is possible and easy for women to report abuse at the face via these online platforms and who is there to simply say no we don't need to make this this is harmful this is not helpful at all so um 
all these um, features, this, these sections are all interconnected and it is simply impossible to extract one from the other and say nothing, we, we can just remove this, we can just focus on this. We have to, the effort to solve this has to be cohesive and it has to um, solve everything at once. We have to systematically approach the solution. And then this brings me to my final slide. It's basically the way forward. And these are probably all solutions we've had at one time or the other. Research, um, we need to do a lot more research, especially in Africa, to solve our own problems. The, the um, social political situation in countries such as the US and the UK and other Western countries and Asian countries, we, which are producing a lot of research related to AI ethics or responsible innovation or AI safety is very different from the sort that we find here in Africa. And even where it's sort of the same, it's still not the same. So we need to develop um, homegrown solutions to these issues. We need to develop, we need to train local talent. We need to set up institutions of faculties at our institu institutions of learning in the computer science departments, in the engineering departments, people, um, courses, modules that are able to implement the solutions that we would like to see. And I think this is a major problem because a lot of our local talent here learn not um, entirely through school or through formal institutions, but learn through online tutorials, they learn through boot camps, they learn through workshops that have been made available to them because there is just no other way of learning. But through this, we find that there is the exclusion of, um, of courses such as um, what I've been referring to training in, um, in, um, in ethics, in you know, in in ways in topics that go beyond the technical, the purely technical aspects of this, and maybe what we need is, is to ensure that um, we sort of create a profession with. I know that as a lawyer myself, or as I know that doctors as well and other professions. Whenever you graduate from these courses, you are essential. You essentially become a professional, and professions usually have um, bodies that regulate that provide rules and procedures for their members. But the absence of this means that there is no one body or no one association that is um, telling its members that these are our rules. These are the the ethics that we comply with, and then. The embedding of ethics and responsible innovation in innovation and supporting of women and girls in STEM. This is impossible. I do not know of any way it would be possible to create, to possibly create um, with artificial intelligence products that do not contribute to technology facilitated or AI facilitated harms against women if there are no women and no girls studying STEM, if there are no women and no girls in the system, and even beyond STEM. There's also the fact that there are other, um, there are other courses, there are other, in the social sciences, in the humanities, there are so many other ways that women are able to come in and contribute, either as journalists, as researchers, as artists, as designers. And we need to ensure that we are involving and representing all these various um, experiences, these various dimensions of knowledge in the work that we create. And I believe that this is the only way we will be able to create um, ethical artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence that does not, that is not detrimental to the rights of women and does not cause further harm to women than it currently does. Thank you very much. Thank you, Favor. Um, you took more than my 10 minutes, but it was worth it. <laughs> I really appreciate your intervention. Um, thank you, everybody, for staying with us. We have just a couple more minutes and we'll be out of here. Um, and I think, and I like what you said, Favor, the example you talked about regarding the chat boards and the virtual assistants. Um, it's interesting to note that, again, biases are being perpetrated as being reflected in those kinds of settings where you have more female virtual assistants than male. It's very, it's a very obvious um, gap that we are having in the society. Um, I also know that a group of researchers recently um, did a test where they 
try to test an algorithm and they put in the word terrorist and the output, the image that it gave as an output was um, a guy that had long beard and um, had a, a hijabi on. So just by the word terrorist, again, being perpetrated as being somebody from, from like parts of the East, Middle East, um, and that's so unfortunate. So really at the end of the day, algorithms truly um, reflect our biases. In fact, they amplify it. So I know we're out of time. And even though there are a lot of questions, I'm not sure we will have the time to take them. I think we should just take the one question um, directed at uh, Dr. Solomon Durso. Um, so Commissioner, if you could kindly respond to this question regarding resolution 473, the one from Mujit Chimo, where he was saying that, how will the commission challenge this state-centric approach of human rights to include big tech companies since they are the major players in this area. And also looking at what's happening with Facebook, how sometimes they defy even being summoned by um, the EU. I'm sure, Karen, you might, you might be able to speak to some of those kinds of situations where they didn't even show up to, where Mark Zuckerberg didn't show up to being summoned by the British parliament and he sent somebody else. So we see this power play and they sometimes feel like they're beyond reproach. So commissioner, how can Africa, uh, deal with that situation? This is an excellent question. I think in so many ways, this question about the assumption of human rights um, relates to one important point, which is basically the assumption that much of the power is in the hands of the state. And therefore the state bears primary responsibility and it is the obligation bearer. That is really a very central assumption of the human rights edifice as we know it. But we have witnessed major transformations in the power dynamics of um, societal actors. And here we are in a moment. I think this has been in the making for a very long time, as we all know. But here we are in a moment where some businesses actually, not just in terms of economic power, I think we can speak about many dimensions of their power, but in terms of economic power, they have much more economic power than even the most powerful of countries that we know on earth. And this presents one of the most formidable challenges to the human rights system as a whole, as we know it, because it hits directly at its very fundamental assumptions, all right? So we have an environment in which, um, an environment in which the state have lost so much of its power. It's not just lost so much of its power, but also I think very important, it, it has lost its policy space. And this crisis, you know, if common across the world, in Europe, central to the crisis that the European countries are facing today is basically the fact that whichever party you elect, whichever government that you put in place, it's not in control of policy making in some of the critical areas in respect of which citizens are expecting governments to have control over. In social, economic policy fields, and this is one of the areas where we see this happening and it is uh, unfolding in front of our eyes. So the question really is, th that is why one of the questions that we need to ask is, where is the locus of regulation and policy making? And obviously the locus is not in one place at the level of the individual state. That is no more the case. There is a role that the state can play, but clearly it is not the most important player. Now, one of the questions that this gives rise to, obviously, is this one. The, the, question of, the question of how about the kind of obligation? I mean, should we move, for example, there is a debate in the UN about having a binding treaty on business 
and human rights. And there is, as you can imagine, business is doing everything that it can in order to thwart that initiative and move. And there is a divide between the developed countries of the North and those who initiated this treaty, South Africa and Ecuador, they are from the developing South, right? This is the first moment in history, if you can say one of those moments in history, when developing countries are trying to take leadership, if you like, in order to uphold international norms, which are being eroded by the level of power that these companies are accumulating. That is why I would say that some of the businesses are operating in a human rights protection vacuum because the state is no longer in a position to exercise effective regulation. So the locus question, we need to have policy and effective regulation at the national level, at the continental level. That's why some of the work that the European Union is doing is something that we need to follow closely at the African continent so that we are able to the extent that we can to follow on the footsteps of the European Union as far as you know, uh, putting in place a continental policy and regulatory framework is concerned. But we also need beyond that, the global level. That is where we have to bring in the debate about this treaty on business and human rights which is happening at the level of the UN um, in, in, um, in Geneva. As we speak, there is ongoing conversation exactly about that, all right? So now, what is it, the strategy that we need to have? As you mentioned, Europe is struggling to bring, to, to uh, rein on these institutions. The US is facing the same challenge, right? But how can we now, take these other common challenges. Look, you are facing a challenge at the US, despite the fact that you are the big country in the world, because of the way these businesses are operating. The same thing with the European Union. And then the rest of us can join in to say, we really need to do something about this. And there is an opportunity for doing this within the ongoing effort towards adopting the Business and Human Rights Treaty in the UN. Thank you so much, Dr. Durso. Um, I'm glad that you brought up the uh, treaty about the business and human rights issue because so far, working principles have been deemed to be as fantastic as they are, they may not be as binding as they should be to hold uh, businesses accountable. Um, final words from, from Karen, uh, only because of so I would love to just get your perspective based on some of the things that Dr. Dorso has said. Um, I see the chat, sorry, everybody. I'm so sorry we cannot come back to some of your um, questions, but I acknowledge all of those questions. So um, Karen, to you, if you want to talk about the GDPR, because I agree that GDPR has been very exemplary and that's something all of us have benefited from um, as, as, a, uh, as a universe. So, but yes, final words from you, Karen. Yes, thank you. So. Okay, uh, the GDPR or the EU AI Act are interesting examples. Also, for the EU AI Act, people are wondering whether we should have a risk based approach or a human rights approach and how much the two are compatible. So, that's one of the issues. And I think that Africa or the continent has to find its own model. Obviously, see what is transplanting, what is transplantable, and what is not. About a um, um, country from the south, in the, and as far as the UN is concerned, where well, they have had an influence since a very long time. The 77 non aligned countries have had quite some successes in the past, and we can just hope that they have. But maybe that's not the divide that we want to perpetuate as far as digital technologies are concerned, because basically, here is an issue of governability. And this issue of governability beyond gov AI governance or technological governance on technologies concerns states, 
versus our continental associations, organizations versus big techs. And I can tell you that, for example, the Commission has been make, making efforts to reach out to other countries worldwide to find common grounds to have the common positions. So that's one point. The second point, as far as the UN is concerned, yes, why not business and business and human rights? We know this thing since quite some time. It's great if they want to try to make a, finally a treaty, a binding treaty, and not just principles, right, that already exist in the field. However, maybe a model that could be followed is to have a UN charter on digital rights. And these UN charters on digital rights will be implemented in the same way as the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is concerned. I know you talked about the disability rights yesterday. So basically what they have is they have a charter of person, UN Charter of Persons with Disability Rights, and they have a committee in charge of uh, um, uh, looking at the implementation of national policies in the field and whether they are coherent with uh, the UN level. I think that at the UN level, it is difficult to get more than that. Frankly enough, we also have to be pragmatic. Why not try the best, but that would be already great. And indeed, after it's um, the right scale might be the continental scale because states alone cannot do some, cannot do anything on their own. And I think that's one of the lessons that EU is showing with its policies. But we shouldn't limit ourselves to just our continent, I think. We should be to have grounds in our own continents and know what are our parameters. But after, we have also to make island alliances worldwide. Thank you. I will stop there. And thank you so much. That's a perfect place to stop. It would be good to see a UN, a UN charter on digital rights emerge sometime in the future. Um, as we've said, the law is always playing catch up. So, Hopefully, by the time it's coming out, the tech has not again leaped forward in multiple bounds. Thank you all so much um, for being on the panel. Um, I really appreciate the time you've spent. I hope we can all continue to move forward from here to see how Africa can ensure that um, human rights are protected um, against the impending threats of technological innovations. It has its benefits, so let's tap into those, and then let's be wary of the ones that could be the pitfalls. Um, thanks again to the Center for Human Rights for organizing this fantastic um, session and this entire week around tech and human rights. Um, it's really important and relevant. And to everybody who has participated, thank you for being here. Um, I'm sure if you want to reach out to any of the panelists, the center will be glad to share the details, the email addresses. And so please, please feel free to reach out subsequently. Um, and so enjoy the rest of your day and good afternoon. Thank you very much to all of you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.